the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back, everyone. Hello, Justin. Hey, Lindsay. So, a little strange, we're doing Exorcist in December. Not that we always do a lot of Christmas movies around this time, but we did do Die Hard last year. Mm -hmm. We love horror movies, and normally this is something that we'd save for October, but it is technically the 50th anniversary of The Exorcist. And technically, I don't know if I would consider this a horror movie. Yeah, I, no, I, we're already I, getting to argument first I mean, <laughs> beginning of the episode. <laughs> I, it's definitely a thriller. It was intentionally released on December twenty sixth of nineteen seventy three. They knew what they were doing. Yeah, well, so was Scream. <laughs> okay, okay, touche. I don't know. I just don't consider it totally a horror movie. Well, I consider it a big time <laughs> horror movie, uh, which I feel weird doing in December. But uh, we, we'll talk about that later. You know, we'll, we'll go into some differences. Uh, the, this is a movie that has so much history. It's like, I don't know that we'll be able to squeeze everything into this episode, but we're going to try starting with how, how this is based on a true story. Uh, we kind of went deeper in research on the uh, true story of this than I thought we would. And I don't know that we'll be able to get all that into the discussion, but we'll try to get, you know, at least a little, the, the cliff notes of the true story of the exorcist that led to the novel that William Peter Blatty wrote. Because that by itself is is its own podcast, really. And very fascinating. And I encourage you to go out and actually, you know, either read something or hear something talking about the 1949 case that we'll do um, an abbreviated version of. You know, we've done over 100 movies for this podcast. And generally, at least like once a month, someone's like, oh, what movie are you guys doing next? If I'm talking to somebody and they're asking me about the podcast. And usually, you know, we'll say the movie and they're like, oh, I love that one. Or I haven't seen that one in forever. Uh, but when I was bringing up The Exorcist, the people, uh, a few people were, were just straight up like that's a movie i'll never watch you know <laughs> or like i read the book and i'll never watch the movie this movie kind of hits a nerve with people and uh, i kind of wanted to get into that later in the discussion because a lot of I, th I feel like the way this movie affects you is like it taps into you know your primal beliefs or your religious beliefs and it's a visceral movie um, but it's also like a movie that is fairly realistic you know it really it takes the subject matter of this very serious it's not kind of played for like a jump scare type movie or like you know and, and i agree with you in, in in some respects like it's not a traditional horror movie in the sense that we have nearly an hour build up of character sure. and yeah. story before anything ultimately creepy happens and when i was younger and i watched this movie I think the first time I was like 12 or 13 and I was at a friend's house, his parents were like, oh, this is the scariest movie ever made. You guys shouldn't watch it. And so, of course, we we're like, oh, well, we're definitely watching it now. It was also promoted as that, yeah. too. The scariest movie and, you'll ever see. And we were uh, bored out of our minds, you know, 12, <laughs> 12 or 13, you know, because we were knee deep in Freddy Krueger and Jason yeah. Voorhees. And it just wasn't an exciting movie for us. Yeah. But now I've really come to appreciate it. It is funny how the reaction to The Exorcist, even when you bring it up, a movie that's 50 years old, still causes someone to be like, I've seen it once. I don't ever need to see it again. Which, for me, I've said that about movies too. Generally, I'll go back and watch them. But like the first thing I think of is like, my one watch and never again dancer in the dark because I'm emotionally destroyed after it, you know? But have I seen it multiple times? Of course. The Exorcist, I think it is deserving of, of multiple views. And not just because I think it's an incredible film, but I think you miss a lot. And of course, the re-release that happened in 2000, which we'll talk about. And with that, when you compare it to the theatrical cut, it does add a lot more to it. So I think that The Exorcist, if you can get past your own uh, hangups about it, when you watch it as a film, it's just jam-packed with themes and meanings and uh, the, the character development for you know, if you consider this a horror movie, is considerably much more uh, massive than your, your regular run-of-the-mill horror film. 
In fact, when I was getting these, our uh, podcast episode notes printed off this morning, which I will say was a record amount of page number compared to what our normal outlines go, the woman who was printing them out, she, like after like a minute and a half, she's like, so um, I see that this has The Exorcist. What, what, what's that about? And I'm like, you mean the movie or like the idea of exorcism? She's like, no, like. What, what what are what are you doing? And I said, well, I do a movie podcast, yada yada. And she said, are you talking about like like real cases of it? I'm like, well, the movie The Exorcist does deal with a real case, and yeah, and I did do some a deep dive on that. And she asked what I thought of it, and I told her, and and she was like super affected by it. And I guess tapped in just this random woman at Office Depot was affected by just seeing it and being like yeah ever since i learned about this i just um i can't let it go i've noticed that there you know certain people are certain affected by like the the evil or like the devil you know like i I mean uh, i would say multiple times in my life i've been checking out somewhere and the price came up 666 and of course yeah the the checker like put in an extra two cents or something (laughs) they're like oh shit you know and so that there is something i think about the the presence of evil and like certain symbolisms that evil you know conjures up and that um people yeah they're just like hey you know what maybe you know and it's like maybe in the back of their head they're like uh i just don't want to invite that into Mm -hmm. my life you know i even had like the 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 deeper that we dug into our research i kind of got started getting a little creeped out you know it's like three or four days of like reading about real exorcisms and this kind of stuff is like, it, it, it does have an effect on your brain, especially depending on how much uh, sleep you've gotten, you know, and <laughs> how uh, alone you are in, in a basement researching by yourself. And also what your religious background is. I'm not going to try to out myself, you know, for anything necessarily, but I'm not um, Catholic, but my I, I don't know. I, I think I'm kind of a, a mixed breed as far as religion goes. My dad's Catholic. My brother's Catholic. My mom is the daughter of a Presbyterian minister. And I grew up in a town where you had Southern Baptist or Methodist. And they were like, well, we're going to just pick more of the middle of the road. So we'll go with Methodist. So I'm kind of um, a mixture of a lot of things that grew up just being taught just be a good person you know so when i look at the exorcist i don't necessarily take it in as something that is my fundamental core beliefs but when you have a lot of different things i certainly grew up with a a, a lot of family that was catholic so the concepts in the film are not unfamiliar to me it's more of the exploration of which is at the core and heart of the exorcist if you believe that there could be something as evil um, as demonic possession, then conversely, you have to accept the existence of God, right? Oh, absolutely. And I'm I'm going to add more to that. We'll get into, you know, how belief systems work into the impact, I think, that the exorcist had. We'll also get into, this is uh, in and of itself a William Freakin tribute episode. We're not going to get as deep into Freakin as some people might want because we're there's so much to talk about with the exorcist but freaking did pass away several months ago and we wanted to do something and then we saw like oh it's going to be the 50th anniversary of the exorcist let's seems like to go hand in hand so we will talk a little bit about freaking's career and of course the production of this movie because he was very involved in this there's a lot of controversies um, about his methods in directing and working with actors some pretty crazy stuff really Oh, yeah, there's going to be a lot more in William Freakin. As far as The Exorcist, we're going to, uh, we already said we'll go into a little bit of the true story, um, where William Peter Blatty was coming from when he wrote The Exorcist, finding a director, adapting it for the screen, the cast. Man, the music behind this movie is, is, is pretty wild, too. I would like to, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see, but there's a lot of special effects notes in, uh, in in the notes here, Justin, and if we can hit on as many memorable scenes, it feels like all of the scenes in The Exorcist have been made into memes nowadays, that I hope that this movie doesn't get whittled down to just the special effects moments, but there are some that still blow my mind today on how effective they are. Yeah, and it's still pretty gross, some of the yeah. stuff. I mean, it's it was a little bit gorier and gruesome than I 
had remembered, even though I've, you know, only seen this like maybe like three years ago, but rewatching it multiple times is like, oh. There's only one scene where there's blood involved, and that's in the extended cut, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, I was think, just thinking more like the projectile vomiting. Yes. Oh, there's a good little nugget in that story, too. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get into that and so much more with The Exorcist. And after our Exorcist talk, we'll get into our picks of the week. And Lindsay, what was your pick of the week? So I went through a couple of different William Friedkin movies. I got to say Rampage that you did a couple episodes ago. That one still sticks out for me. Um, but I did the Friedkin film that stars Ashley Judd, Bug, which I had not seen before and definitely went a route that I was not expecting. That's a movie I really appreciate and a really great late career uh, film from Friedkin. Yeah. And what about you? What was your pick? Um, I, I went back and forth because uh, I was I wanted to do a Friedkin film since we're doing a tribute. And uh, I went for a movie that I hadn't seen, which is probably one of the most controversial movies of his career. And I had always kind of kept putting it off, putting it off. And finally, I was like, I, I just need to sit down and get into some Friedkin films I hadn't seen. And so I went with... Uh, early 80s uh, film of his starring Al Pacino cruising. Yes. I'm so glad you did that. As always, we'll round things out with our Murray moment before we go into our first clip from The Exorcist. Lindsay, this title for this movie seems pretty self-explanatory, but there's so much going on. Can you give us your brief lowdown, your interpretation of what this movie is about? Chris McNeil and her daughter Reagan live a cushier life than most. Chris is a well-known actress, but the most challenging role of her life is that of mother, especially after her spirited and kind-hearted daughter begins exhibiting peculiar signs that something might be wrong with her. As exhaustive medical testings keep failing her, Reagan's symptoms are becoming violent, repulsive, and possibly supernatural, turning to self-harm and being capable of murder. The agnostic Chris is at her wit's end and turns to a faith-based route to help her daughter. She seeks out Father Karras, a local priest who has recently had his own beliefs challenged, for guidance. Karras must determine if Reagan has been inhabited by a demon and, if so, how to proceed. Enlisting the help of the only known exorcist around, Father Marin, together they must fight to save Reagan before she slips away to an unseen enemy. Inspired by true events, and no matter what your beliefs, if for nothing else— the Exorcist shows us that anyone is susceptible to evil. Well, thanks for that summary. Um, let's go into our first clip from The Exorcist. We'll be back. We'll get into it. Hello, Reagan. I'm a friend of your mother's. I'd like to help you. You want to loosen the straps, huh? I'm afraid you might hurt yourself, Reagan. I'm not Reagan. I see. Well, then, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras. And I'm the devil. Now kindly undo these straps. If you're the devil, why not make the straps disappear? That's much too vulgar display of power, Karras. Where's Reagan? In here with us. Show me Reagan and I'll loosen one of the straps. And you're helping old altar boy, father. Your mother's in here with us, Karras. Would you like to leave a message? I see that she gets it. If that's true, then you must know my mother's maiden name. What is it? What is it? Well, I've lost count of how many scary movies that I've seen that have had the tagline based on a true story <laughs> or based on real events or something like that. Certainly, The Exorcist is no different. I was kind of startled, though, by how much information that William Peter Blatty put in his book that ended up in The Exorcist that was based off of actual researched you know, supposedly real events, not just like, eh, this happened, you know, this guy killed his family, but, you know, he wore uh, certain kind of shoes. And so I put that shoes on this killer in this <laughs> movie. It was, it was a lot of information, a lot of story, a lot of significant happenings that went on that, uh, you know, were pulled from history and placed into the novel, which then 
went into the movie. And when Blatty was a sophomore or junior at Georgetown University, he came across this article in the Washington Post, um, which was about a local boy or, you know, this boy that lived about 30 minutes from him who had, uh, there was a claim that he had been demonically possessed and had gone through an exorcism. And Blatty, um, having going to a Catholic university, this was something that, you know, really stuck out to him. And he couldn't ever shake the idea. And originally, he wanted to research this actual event. I mean, it's one thing to go off of news articles. And there certainly were things that were, you know, in those articles that were alarming and, and, and certainly things that you don't ever hear about, but would make one want to investigate them more, which was what Blatty wanted to do. Originally... He wasn't thinking about writing a novel or writing a screenplay, anything like that. He just wanted to research and do a nonfiction book on this uh, account, which happened in January of 1949. There were many names uh, given to this boy, but I think since his death in, I think 2000, not 2001, it was revealed that his name was Ronald Edwin Hunkler, who grew up to work for NASA and who never really revealed, obviously, that this story happened to him. I mean, why would you? I don't think it would be something I would want to advertise either. In comparing Ronald's story to what happened in The Exorcist, um, there are a considerable amount of similarities, like you said, Justin, in, in things like it's starting out minor, you know, you're hearing these scratchings and noises that you can't really place where they're coming from. And in fact, it was documented that, you know, the family thought it was rats. They thought it was rats in the house, which is something that we see in The Exorcist. And aside from it starting out pretty slow, it's a, this slow progression, Ronald's story does differ from from Reagan's. I mean, noticing that both their names start with an R, I don't think that that's a coincidence either. But when things really took a turn for the worse for Ronald was when his aunt passed away. Ronald lived in Maryland. His aunt Harriet lived in St. Louis. And his aunt Harriet passing away had a profound effect on him. It also needs to be said that it was his aunt Harriet who introduced him to how to use a Ouija board. But she explained to him, you know, that a Ouija board is used to communicate with the dead. There's a lot of speculation here as to, you know, if there was some type of demonic possession was it something related to the Ouija board? Was it something not? Was it something with Aunt Harriet? Who knows? We don't really know. But these disturbances began before Aunt Harriet died and continued to ramp up after her death. Things like mattress shaking, thumping, things getting louder in the house, and not being able to explain where this is coming from. And it's not just Ronald that's seeing this. It's his family. It's everyone that's around him. There are multiple witnesses and all of this is documented. So this begins in January. And by uh, mid-February, the family doesn't, like we see in The Exorcist, consult with, uh, at least that I could find, doesn't consult with any doctor. They do go to their local Lutheran minister. The boy stays uh, a night with that minister and that's when some more strange stuff happens there. The bed shakes and I think an armchair gets moved across the room and the minister who was known to, you know, not really believe in demonic possession, not really something that he was even thinking about. After a night of this, he tells the family, okay, so there's something going on here and I don't think that I'm equipped to handle it, but um, the Catholics know something about this. So he says, you need to get in touch with some Catholic priests. There were some poorly attempted exorcisms, I guess you could say, um, that were attempted at Georgetown Hospital. This was like the latter half of February into March, which ended with Ronald attacking one of the priests with a broken bed spring and slashing him from his throat to his wrist. So things were getting really bad. And like we see in The Exorcist, there were words that were popping up on his body that couldn't be explained. Some were coming up in a branding, others were red writing, none of which could be explained that someone was doing it because from all accounts, it was happening in front of multiple people as everyone was witnessing it, which is, I think to me, like one of the most alarming things about this. Like, how do you get in 1949 that many people to lie about something that's so unsettling. So during this time, this is when um, the letters come up on the boy's body 
Lewis Saturday and three and a half weeks. And they think, oh, Lewis, maybe that has something to do with St. Louis. So taking a cue from those scratchings on Ronald's body, the family goes to St. Louis and has family there. And that's where Aunt Harriet was. And they did hold some kind of makeshift seances. By mid-March, they kind of partnered up with Archbishop Joseph Ritter and Fathers Bowdern and Bishop, and they began investigating the possibility of demonic possession, which did lead them to performing um, an exorcism. But it wasn't just like one. It was over a really long amount of time. Like this whole experience for Ronald lasted at least three months. Like we said, it started back in Maryland. And then when the family went to St. Louis, it continued there with these Catholic priests and it amped up. There was still writing on the body. At this point, Ronald was becoming much more belligerent. There was as we see in The Exorcist, some mimicking of masturbation. I read something where it was copious amounts of urination, like it seemed inhuman that he was like urinating himself this much. And also showing um, that he was much stronger than a boy of his size. So this happening in St. Louis, um, the priests tried to, you know, get the what they thought was the demon from his body out, out of him. And that didn't happen. And they returned to Maryland. The, the fathers agreed to go back with the boy to Maryland. I mean, it doesn't I don't want to say it feels redundant, but they were just like beating their heads against a wall, trying the same things over and over and over again. And nothing was changing. And at that point, they decided to take the boy back to St. Louis, which is where I think is where St. Alexian Hospital uh, comes into play, where the boy was housed for a while. In the movie, they seek medical attention in in the 40s that, you know, there was some talk about, you know, this is is it a mental health disorder, you Mm -hmm. know, because a lot of the things that he was experiencing in today, they would say that, you know, it's a mental health issue and he's like experiencing psychosis or something else. And so, uh, but in the forties, mental health wasn't where it is today. So like sanitariums or like psychiatric facilities, they kind of just like housed people almost like it was a prison, you know, and they just drugged them up. There wasn't really like therapy. A lot of times patients would end up worse off than they were before they went into a sanitarium. And his parents did look into you know, some of this and finding out the conditions of these places, they were like, that's not an option for us, you know? And they were, so they were, you know, continuing on this path of, we're going to talk to Catholic priests and find out full on, like, this is a demonic possession. Like the only possible outcome is that we need the help from a, from a priest. It seemed like if you had a relative and you put them in a mental institution, then that was basically, you'll never see him again. And that that was worse than the idea of dealing with demonic possession. And we see a little bit of that in The Exorcist where Karis can't afford to put his mother in a nice place. And so he goes there and sees the conditions of the place and is really destroyed by it, you know, and that she died in a place like that. When we got to this part of the research, it was a little creepy because where we record from here in the studio is a mere two blocks away from St. Louis University where a lot of this story takes place where they're consulting with priests who are at St. Louis University and then Alexian Brothers Hospital is probably only another mile away from here. I think even just someone from St. Louis and maybe it's just the age that I am, there was the old city hospital that was defunct. I I forget for how long before it was torn down and turned into condominiums now. But I remember even hearing rumors that it was like, oh no, that's where the exorcist happened was in the old city hospital. So even in St. Louis, you know, whether it is, it's, it's known that part of it happened here, that it was, it's always been kind of like a thing in St. Louis that um, people talk about the exorcist. Yeah, absolutely. So, Three months later, this boy was deemed to be free of um, a demon that was in him. And um, I mean, after, like like we said, multiple, multiple hours and days, months of, of attempting to free this boy from, from what he was afflicted with. And there, like you said, there were a lot of thoughts behind was this a psychiatric issue? Was the boy's relationship with his aunt? Maybe there was something more there that caused some type of like psychosis. Um, who knows? Because we don't have any of those answers. A lot of it's speculation. But when you look at things, like, and this is where it, it always is weird to me, when you have 
like one of the things in the church doctrine is uh, to be de- demonically possessed, you have to be speaking in a language that's foreign to you. And this boy did do that. He was speaking and cursing in Latin. And though we don't see that in The Exorcist, she is speaking in reverse English. So it's um, not exactly a throwback to it, but it is kind of in the same vicinity. And I like in the movie that they do it in reverse because I think even in the 70s and 80s, you know, it's like, oh, you play a record backwards and you can hear like <laughs> yeah. there's hidden messages in there. And I like that it just made it a little more, I think, um, tangible to an audience of, you know, when they reversed it, you hear what is actually being said is like some sort of evil talk, evil speak versus just a language that an audience might be unfamiliar with. You're so right about that because to hit on at the time in the 70s, Speaking in Latin, while it was something that that the Catholic Church would determine is, oh yeah, you might be possessed by the devil. In the 70s, we were a, a society that was scared of a lot of things, cults and Manson and yeah, playing records backwards to hear the hidden meaning. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but it really would play into hitting on a, a cultural nerve. So there were no deaths associated with this 1949 case. Um, Of course, there are three deaths in The Exorcist, but the similarities when you go back and compare the stories are pretty undeniable. Now, in writing this story for William Peter Blatty, this was a guy that was coming off of a comedy career, kind of a budding comedy career. But in the late 60s into the 70s, his style of writing was kind of not as wanted anymore. And he kind of felt a little bit uh, that he needed to be a little bit more of a respected writer. So he wanted to write something seriously. And this story, writing a nonfiction novel about this story seemed to be what he was honing in on. And he actually did track down Father Bowdern, who helped with the 1949 case and asked him if he'd be interested. And Bowdern was really receptive to the idea. But when he checked with one of his higher ups, if this was okay to talk about, um, he was reminded that he was sworn to secrecy to not talk about it, not publicize it, if not for the church, but for the boy involved that this would not help his life or really help anyone. But Bowdern felt that if someone were to document this story, he didn't see anything bad in talking about it. If anything, he thought that it would actually, what I feel like in the Christian community, it felt like talking about this would actually like help in some way of people facing like the idea of good versus evil. If there's a devil, then there must be a God. So creating this dialogue. Um, But Bowdern did say to Blatty that there was no doubt in his mind at that point when Blatty asked him in the early 70s or in the late 40s, he said that there was no doubt in his mind that this kid was demonically possessed, which just lit Blatty's fire even more. And he decided to press on with writing the story and requested Father Birmingham, who taught him in high school, to help him kind of be a guide through telling the story. With the Exorcist novel, what Blatty hit on really like struck me and also like the movie's st- struck me is that it's not necessarily just this story about a kid who's being possessed or like evil exists, but like there's almost like a body horror element to it in a sense that like if if you hear anybody who denies God and I don't want to get into like a, you know, (laughs) yeah, religious discussion, but like generally the number one thing you hear people say with like their disbelief in God is that, you know, if, if God exists, why would there be cancer and why would be suffering and their body be suffering? And in this movie, you know, the ex, the demon is like deteriorating a body, like deteriorating, sucking the life, like utilizing the body is the shell, like not valuing life. And so there's evil there. And to me, what makes the book, The Exorcist, so powerful and the movie, The Exorcist, so powerful, this belief in that this is an evil entity. And if evil exists, then therefore God must exist. And it feels very, it's it's strange, like the book and the movie itself feel very, uh, as controversial as they are, feels very like pro-God and pro-religion and kind of makes religion the good guy in this movie and uh, the devil, the evil, the villain in very much like ways so many movies do, but it's taken to a much more like closer to home level with this movie and this novel. And along with tapping into that kind of fundamental like core values that exist within humans. Um, 
there is this also this element of the story that it's happening to they're they're your neighbors they're they're you and me they're just like us and also that this is happening to a child i think when you take all of these things and then combine it with you know destabilizing like american values in a lot of ways in this movie because there's i mean so many things from i mean things that seem relatively harmless uh, reagan's from a broken home but has a supportive mom um we have uh, regular cursing in the house and we see like things that seem normal, but then we're completely broken down after that to where it's no holes barred and no one has experience dealing with, with what's happening. So you're left with no foundation and not knowing how to proceed forth. So with all of these questions, then you're faced with the questioning of faith when you're someone who's a complete agnostic like Chris McNeil, Reagan's mom. It's a movie that really puts you in the driver's seat, which I, I think is why one of the reasons that it affects people so deeply. Yeah, and, and also the unique perspective of Father Karras, who is generally in movies when we see someone who's like, quote unquote, man of the cloth or like, mm-hmm. you know, they're, it's a very blanket version of a character, you know, like, oh, they're only good. They don't do anything bad. They, you know, believe in God. They uphold everything. And they're the person that you go to when you're in trouble, when you're lost, because they have the answers, because they live a self-righteous life. And this is not the case with this character. I mean, he's like questioning his faith. He's questioning his beliefs. And when he's put to the test of like trying to be the person who has to be in charge of helping with this exorcism, he doesn't feel that he's worthy or up to the task. And he's battling with that. And we spend a good portion of the movie, um, I would say like, a third of the movie yeah. uh, is is developing his character and his belief system being shaken. And then also when he starts seeing Reagan and feeling this evil entity starts messing with him and is like preying upon his own belief system and his own fears and what he is ashamed of, or it's, it's pretty terrifying. And again, I think that's why this movie digs a little bit deeper than your everyday like demonic possession movie. You know, it's really handling all this material in a tasteful manner, but by doing so makes it more scary than a movie that is just going for like exploitative scares, yeah. which I'm a big fan of. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love a jump, a good jump scare, but this movie's on another level to me. Yes, totally. And Blatty really wasn't going for a jump scare type of thing. But after realizing he's not going to be able to write a nonfiction novel, no one is going to talk to him on the record about anything. He considers writing a screenplay and gets about two pages in to writing a screenplay and his mother dies and he shelves that for just a short little while. But the spark is reignited when he happens to go to this party. I think he talks about this. He's like, I'm not really a party guy, but I happen to go to this New Year's Eve party. And an editor-in-chief at Bantham Books um, asked him, knew he was a writer, knew he was a comedy writer, asked if he was working on anything. And Blatty hadn't fleshed out what you know, this this story was going to be. He knew it was going to be a priest that was going to perform an exorcism. That's about as far as he had gotten, but he gave him the thumbnail idea and pretty much the editor agreed on the spot. Hey, yeah, I'll go ahead and put that book out, which kind of blew Blatty's mind. And he offered him a small advance of $4,200. And at this point, Blatty had been collecting unemployment checks. Like I said, he was an unemployed comedy writer. And this was going to be his chance to write a serious novel. So for the next 10 to 12 months, He spent 18 hours a day, he said, writing this story and not really knowing where he was going. He just wrote chapter by chapter. He had a vague idea as he was going through it. But Blatty did admit to having zero confidence in himself that he was going to be able to pull this off. Even um, having a touchstone like Lieutenant Kinderman that he has a fondness for in in the first one. And then um, subsequently in Exorcist 3 that he used that character as kind of a minor comedy outlet for him personally. So Blatty cranked this novel out and um, just around a year, he showed it to one of his friends who was really disturbed by it and really like, he. I don't know if he was exaggerating or not, but he said he was like going through panic sweats reading it. And Blatty said he was so excited when he finish this novel and he said he might have gotten a little drunk and took before it was published took it over to actress Shirley MacLaine 
and shoved it in her face and said, this character, I base this character on you. And this is your, this is what's going to make you a superstar and gave it to her. I think it took her three weeks or something to get around to it. But when she finally did, she said, this is amazing. I want to star in it. And she did get a development deal started with uh, producer Lou Grade. But once Blatty found out that Grade was uh, trying to cut him out of the deal, um, Blatty reneged on it and was like, nope, this isn't going to happen. I'm not going to be iced out of this. And this was when Harper and Rowe published the book and producer uh, Paul Monash offers Blatty $400,000 to option the book. He sells it to Warner Brothers for, I think, like $640,000. Blatty again finds out that another producer is trying to ice him out of the creative process, change the story. And Blatty confronts Warner Brothers about this and says that he's not going to stand for it. And strangely, Warner Brothers backs down knowing that without the writer behind them, um, this isn't going to work. So they did drop Monash, leaving Blatty as the sole producer of what would become The Exorcist. And what would come next would be finding a director, which would again be another challenge. Well, before we get into the challenge that was making The Exorcist the movie, let's go to another clip and we'll come back. We'll talk about freaking the production and how this movie got made. Look, I'm only against the possibility of doing your daughter more harm than good. Nothing you could do could make it any worse. I can't do it. I need evidence that the church would accept his signs of possession. Like what? Like her speaking in a language she's never known or studied. What else? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I thought you were supposed to be an expert. There are no experts. You probably know as much about possession as most priests. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. Now, if you've seen as many psychotics as I have, you'd realize that's the same thing as saying you're Napoleon Bonaparte. You ask me what I think is best for your daughter. Six months under observation in the best hospital you can find. You show me Reagan's double. Same face, same voice, everything. And I'd know it wasn't Reagan. I'd know in my gut. I'm telling you that that thing upstairs isn't my daughter. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that. Now, as we ultimately know, William Freakin did become the director of The Exorcist, though he wasn't the studio's first choice at all. They had a list of seven directors. Uh, Freakin's name was not on that list. Names that were on the list included uh, Stanley Kubrick, Mike Nichols, Arthur Penn, and John Cassavetes. It's not a big surprise at this point in Friedkin's career, he hadn't really established himself as a named director. He got a start in WGN-TV in Chicago and was mainly working in their mailroom, then went on to start helping out with documentaries, live television productions, eventually moved to Hollywood, and there started working in television as a director, you know, directed a episode of one of the Hitchcock TV shows in the 60s, did a feature film that starred Sonny and Cher that he deemed uh, absolute trash. <laughs> and he did a couple of, of feature films that weren't really notable, that didn't garner very much acclaim. He did adapt a feature film of the stage production of The Boys in the Band, which did give him a little bit of um, people started, you know, eyeballing him as someone who... Uh, had some talent. Um, he also had very strong opinions, wasn't uh, someone who would back down from anybody. And if he didn't like something, he would let them know. And so that's a personality I think goes a long way. Like it can rub a certain person the wrong way. It can also make someone who is uh, higher up in their career uh, it might be refreshing to them. They're used to getting their ass kissed or someone telling them everything they do is great. And uh, Freakin was definitely not that personality. Um, and it was an interaction between him and William Peter Blatty when Blatty was uh, working on the book that uh, made him think of Freakin for directing, even though the studio was uh, wildly against it. 
And it was an experience that William Peter Blatty had with William Friedkin, where he had written a script uh, with another writer, Blake Edwards, and they wanted Friedkin to direct it or give his opinion on it. And Friedkin, I guess, read it and said, this is completely terrible. What do you um, kind of raked him across the coals? And while Edwards was a little put off by it, it was Blatty, this experience that Blatty really was thankful and he actually told him afterwards there was one scene that Friedkin really ripped on and Blatty said thank you I really appreciate it I I know that this isn't the greatest thing I've ever written but I needed to hear what you said and I think it I don't know if the experience really affected Friedkin the same way that it did Blatty but um, it never left uh, Blatty's head and it was something that he thought this is my big uh, entrance into serious writing and this was a director that he really respected so why not seek him out for the exorcist blatty also thought that it would be interesting to have an agnostic jew um spearheading a movie like this that it would create a unique perspective um, of a movie that's dealing with a bunch of catholics so blatty sends the book the exorcist to friedkin friedkin was on a press tour for the french connection which was about to open Now, while Friedkin had heard about The Exorcist, he hadn't read it, and he kind of put off reading the book. He knew of Blatty as a humorist and just thought, you know, is this going to be really any good? Didn't really put any stock in it. So kind of like Shirley MacLaine, it took him a little while to read it. But then when he did, he said he finished the book in a couple hours and couldn't put it down, thought it was so intense and yes, totally wanted to direct it, of course, with notes as any director would. So... Blatty goes to Warner Brothers and says, Friedkin, I mean, this this is the guy. We have to use this guy. And behind Blatty's back, Warner Brothers went ahead and hired another director, and that was Mark Rydell. Understandably, Blatty's PO'd. And once again, Blatty's vision is interrupted, and he kind of, I mean, he, he threatens Warner Brothers again and says, if you guys do this, I'm going to not only sue you, but he I think he was due to go on The Tonight Show that week. I'm going to go on The Tonight Show and I'm going to tell everyone what you guys are doing and that this is corrupting my vision. I'm going to badmouth you. And I think he didn't have like a solid uh, legal footing to stand on to threaten Warner Brothers, but I guess the threat alone got Warner Brothers to back down and at least dismiss Mark Rydell, and kind of right around the same time, The French Connection was released, at which point they reassessed Friedkin. The French Connection was a big hit and was getting great reviews. And with that, pretty much William Friedkin was hired. I think a lot of people are familiar with The French Connection, but at the time of its release, it was a massive hit. This was a movie that was made on a very tiny budget which is why I think even though he had that movie, the production was under Freakin's belt, the studio was still like, eh, we don't know what this movie is going to be. It could just be this sort of low budget exploitation movie. And then uh, Freakin took like sort of an exploitation type crime story and spun it into like a really serious tale that was exciting and entertaining. The movie ended up making $75 million worldwide, which doesn't sound like much by today's standards, but in the early 70s, that was it was a huge, huge, you know, lot of tickets being sold and, uh, you know, universal acclaim for the movie and for him as a director. And there's no way to make a studio feel more comfortable than having a director uh, start a production coming off of like a massive hit. And that, I think, ensured the production not to have as much red tape as they might have had to go through if uh, Freakin was going into directing it, not having a hit on his hands and just kind of having to battle the studio you know, every step of the way, which there were still battles to be had, but, you know, at least they had some confidence in him directing the movie before the movie started shooting. And this wouldn't be the only person um, that Warner Brothers didn't want to hire that they reluctantly did later on. With Freakin' On Board, Blatty cranked out a first draft of the script, which Freakin' really didn't care for. He thought that um, he was playing up more of the horror aspects and that it was too much jumping around. Um, Blatty was condensing information to making it just, it didn't, it didn't work for Freakin' and he also thought it was too flashy. Now, taking that constructive criticism, um, they decided to adapt the novel together, which seemed to work out pretty well. Friedkin marked sections of the book that he thought were going to be filmable, and Blatty turned it into the script. Obviously, as with any book to a film, there's going to be stuff that's left, you know, and not included in the book. But it seems like it was 
read the book if you want to know the full story, but there's certainly um, characters in the movie that have more of a prominent role in the book. The two things that Friedkin definitely wanted um, was to make sure that this was not going to be um, an advertisement for Catholicism. As an agnostic guy, he was like, I'm not going to be part of that, but I support this being a movie about, you know, good triumphing over evil. That made sense to him. He also wanted it to be believable because this is in some ways an unbelievable story, but to not have there be any distance between the audience being able to put themselves in the shoes of the main characters. So once they have the second draft done, shooting begins August 1972. Now for a movie where the majority of the movie takes place in a house, in a bedroom, uh, this was a really long shoot. It was like six months long, like 100 days of shooting. And I wanted to mix cast in a little bit here into the discussion. Um, we're kind of going to go back and forth into the production because this is a little bit longer episode. There's a lot of ground to cover here. But as you mentioned before, the studio wasn't a fan of Freakin being a director. As soon as Freakin and William Peter Blatty were on the same page and they wanted to cast the mother, the studio immediately did not want Ellen Burstyn to play the role and Freakin really wanted someone that was an unknown, that was an unknown face. And I think that makes a lot of sense, really, because the character itself is a movie actor. And you don't want the focus of the movie being an actor playing an actor, you know, which it very well could have been if it was like a very famous person who's playing an actor. I think an audience could have got kind of caught up in that. And then you're going deeper into this world of like, this is an actor. This is their thing. They're famous. And with an unrecognizable face, um, I think with any horror movie, we've talked about this many times in many different episodes, you don't have an immediate connection to another movie that you've seen them in or another character that they've played. And so I think it was a really great choice. And Ellen Burstyn, as we know, is a phenomenal actor, did a knockout job and is very convincing um, in this role. And there's so many emotions that she goes through. I mean, there's a huge chunk of the movie that's just like her dealing with her daughter being sick and her trying to find an answer and being completely terrified that not only is an evil presence starting to invade their lives, but that her only daughter is like possibly going to die or suffering some sort of sickness. Um, she can't figure it out. And she's, you know, trying to go to anyone who could possibly give her an answer. And all she's getting is either a bunch of BS or a bunch of like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. They're, she's not getting any definitive answers. That goes into one of the themes of this movie too, is questioning medical science too behind it. it I mean, it's exhausting how much that Burstyn's Chris McNeil goes through. Like, I mean, every single doctor that you can think of it and every single procedure is performed on Reagan. And at the end of the day, right before the doctors see little Reagan in a possessed state, they there's a line that's like, there's just nothing there. And there really isn't. There just isn't anything medically wrong with her that they can find. And as you said earlier in the episode, the real child who was uh, suffering from this, this lasted a very long time. It wasn't like he got sick and started acting weird. And then like two weeks later, he was, they were doing an exorcism. And this movie takes its time as well. You know, it starts with her acting, you know, she's a totally normal child in the beginning. Uh, they're having a party. Reagan comes downstairs. You know, she should be sleeping. The adults are partying and she tells one of the party guests that he's going to die up there and then urinates on the floor. Pretty alarming. Oh, okay, what's going on? Was she dreaming? Was she sleepwalking? And it's it's a slow, steady um, descent into her body starting to be disfigured and her going to medical facilities to try to figure out what's going on. We've got discussions with doctors. The movie really takes its time. And kind of going back to, again, what you said when we first started this, that you don't necessarily deem this a horror film. The more I think about this movie, the more I agree with you, because it is... For the first hour, we're really dealing with a mystery. You know, it's a thriller. It's a mystery that's slowly being unraveled. And we don't really get to any sheer horror till um, a full hour or so into the film when you do start to see her body get disfigured and you do start to see her change from a little girl into this entity that is pretty terrifying to look at. In that first hour of the film, we're following two main actors, Ellen Burstyn and Jason Miller, who plays Father Karras. And while Friedkin wanted someone that was 
not really known to the audience for the character of Chris McNeil, Warner Brothers had other thoughts. They immediately were like, Audrey Hepburn, that's the first person that we want to play this role, which she would have done a bang up job, definitely. And she actually was interested in doing it, but told Warner Brothers, if you move the production to Rome, where I'm living, I'll 100% do it. Freakin was like, there's absolutely no way we're moving everything to Rome and shooting this. We need an American setting. This is where it's got to happen. So Hepburn's out. Warner Brothers then thought Anne Bancroft. Anne Bancroft was interested, but pregnant. And this is going to be a long production. That was not going to work. Another person that was considered was Jane Fonda, who had absolutely less than zero interest in doing this movie. And then also there was the Shirley MacLaine hope uh, because William Peter Blatty knew her, but that seemed to kind of get pushed out the window early on. So with all of these names being kind of thrown around, it was actually Ellen Burstyn who contacted Friedkin and really lobbied for the role. She knew that she had stiff competition. She knew who the other women were that were being considered for this role. And Friedkin liked her. He thought that she had a grace and intelligence about her. He'd liked her in the last picture show. She had a supporting role in that film. He wasn't against the idea, but he had already planned to meet with another actress, I think either the same day or the same week that she had contacted him. So she says, okay, fine, read her, do whatever you need to do, but I want an audition. I want to read for you. As the story goes, uh, after this kind of initial communication that they had, Friedkin calls Burstyn back and says, you've got the part. And it kind of took Ellen off guard. And she's like, okay, what have you already met with this other actress? And he said, no, I didn't. I ran into her at a deli last night and she looked like complete shit, which is exactly what Friedkin would say. And Burstyn says, hey, that's not fair. I would look like shit in the middle of the night at a deli too. And Friedkin said... Well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. You got the part. Um, He does tell Warner Brothers about this. And the head of Warner Brothers, Ted Ashley, said, absolutely over my dead body is Ellen Burstyn going to star in this film. But the problem was Warner Brothers and Blatty couldn't agree on someone. And the Warner Brothers suggestions weren't panning out. So it kind of... In a sense, this role just kind of fell to Ellen Burstyn. And thankfully, this role did go to her. I think she does an incredible job in this film. And I know it's hard to say after the fact, you know, who would have been better in this, somebody else. Shirley MacLaine, I think, would have been awesome in this role, too. But honestly, Ellen Burstyn, I can't unsee her in this film. And the, like you said, the range of emotions and journey that she goes on. And you see her going from a celebrity, which is kind of downplayed a little bit, like her celebrity status. But you see her going from someone who is of an upper class to being completely broken down and being tormented, watching her daughter degrade. And she's doing everything that she can and feels completely helpless. Again, going back into that theme of the parental child um, like relationship and the ever evolving idea of what childhood, you know, how, how kids change anyway during childhood, but this is a complete metamorphosis. This movie I appreciate for the fact that Freakin didn't dumb anything down for an audience. And I, I feel like a lot of movies of the seventies were that way. Um, there, there's not so much handholding that happens. For example, there's kind of showing how much of a celebrity she is and you've been invited to the white house and it's like, Oh, the white house is not that far away yeah. from where they're staying. Don't, really set up like how big of a celebrity she is mm-hmm. like you see her on set of this movie and there's a lot of extras and it looks like a big Hollywood production but it's not in Los Angeles slowly explains who she is in a very solid way not in a boring way I mean the pacing of this movie definitely is not of modern times I mean you have to have the patience to let the story develop I'm there for the characters I want to see where they're going and who they're communicating with because it makes the second part more scary to me because I care about these characters and I, you know, kind of want to see them either succeed or get out of harm's way. And while there is a relatively small cast to this film, it is kind of all stemming off of Chris McNeil. Um, We'll get to Linda Blair in a second, who plays her daughter, Reagan, but I thought we'd probably do Jason Miller, who plays father Damien Karras first. He was also not a familiar face to Hollywood. Now, Ellen Burstyn, she wasn't unfamiliar. She'd definitely been in in plenty of films before this, um, but this was definitely her biggest role at the time. Now, Jason Miller was not, I mean, not even someone to be considered for this. Freakin' actually sought him out. 
people like Jack Nicholson and Paul Newman, these were the names being thrown around for this. With Warner Brothers wanting main stars for this, they'd already conceded, okay, we'll take Ellen Burstyn, fine, but we want a bigger name. Well, not if it's up to Friedkin. Friedkin happened to see um, a play that Jason Miller had written called The Championship Season. It was playing on Broadway and was receiving a ton of positive feedback and reviews. And Friedkin said that when he saw it, it just kind of reeked of failed Catholicism. So he wanted to investigate who this Jason Miller guy was and contacted him. And I guess initially Jason Miller thought that Friedkin was going to ask him to write the screenplay for for the exorcist he had not read the book um i don't think he had heard of it or if he had it been like a little bit of rumor um but he hadn't read it so when freaking said no i don't want you to write it i want you to audition for it which kind of blew miller away um was not expecting it and i guess with their first meeting neither one of them got the best impression of each other freaking thought that Jason Miller seemed really cold. He was standoffish and it just didn't, I think he even said he was lacking in verbal skills. Like what? I mean, the, the guy does not mince any words and Miller wasn't really getting the best um, impression from freaking either. So they did part ways um, with the, you know, idea of keep it in your head. We'll see. But Jason Miller didn't exactly turn it down, but freaking left that meeting thinking I got to go with somebody else. In the meantime, Jason Miller goes ahead and picks up The Exorcist and reads it. While he's reading it, um, the part of Father Karras was cast with Stacey Keach, who was definitely a name at the time. So uh, we've got someone playing Father Karras um, at this point. But then Jason Miller calls Friedkin and says, you've got to cast me. I am Father Karras. I need, th- this is the role that I need. Yes, I will completely do it. And Friedkin says, I mean, that's great and everything. I love that you have a Catholic background. And he learns that he actually dropped out of school to become a priest. Um, but Friedkin says, well, sorry, man, we've already hired somebody. I don't know what to do from here. And I guess Jason Miller really convinced Friedkin that he deserves an audition. And, and Freakin said, okay, if you can get out here to California in the next two days, I'll go ahead and audition you. Well, Jason Miller's in New York and I guess apparently afraid of flying. And Freakin said, well, this isn't going to happen. And Jason Miller convinces him, you've got to wait a couple more days. I'm going to take a train. I'll be out there. And for being as opinionated and unwavering in so many things as William Friedkin is, he agreed to it. And so Jason Miller went out to California, did a screen test, uh, auditioned with Ellen Burstyn, and she interviewed him. And the audition went really well. At the same time, his play was gaining even more traction in New York, and he was developing a name as a writer. Um, Freakin says, okay, I do want you for the role. Then he has to go through the arduous process of telling Warner Brothers, cool, um, remember how you hired Stacy Keach? I'm going to need you to buy out his contract and we want this guy instead. I have no idea if someone did make a deal with the devil or whatever William Friedkin did, but that seems like a pretty big deal and more money to just like piss away for Warner Brothers to buy somebody out of a contract for a guy who was relatively unknown. This was Jason Miller's first film. But what an effective job Jason Miller did in this movie. And I think the one thing that I walk away with the most when I watch The Exorcist is like, how how come Jason Miller wasn't immediately cast in like all of these like very serious roles post Exorcist? It's kind of crazy to me because not only does he have a total screen presence and a look and a vibe about him, he really carries like a lot of prestige, you know, the way he acts, the way he commands a scene, the way he interacts with Burstyn, you know, he can be compassionate, he can be angry, and he can be terrified. Um, He kind of goes through an incredible range of emotion throughout the entire film. And he's a mystery to the audience. In the beginning, you know, Burstyn's character spots him, and they have this sort of, she has this sort of strange connection to him. And then slowly she pulls him into her world. It all feels very natural. Again, it's a character that is questioning in his faith that makes for a really great character because it's someone who um, isn't self-assured. You know, so many times when we're watching a movie, 
we are watching characters who are full of confidence and are there to save the day. And we don't question that that might not happen because we're like, no, these are the good guys. And this is a movie that doesn't do that. And this is a character that's not set up that way. And so, uh, you know, you immediately you're like, what's, what's the deal with this guy? Like, he's like, is he like having a total breakdown? And then he's going through depression, really down in the dumps and is like kind of pulled out of that. And then, Dealing with the guilt of his yeah, mother dying. Yeah, and then, and then faced with like this incredible um, challenge that, you know, he's barely, it, you know, has the strength and like the wherewithal to like get up and go down outside of his house and like get something to eat, much less like battle uh, the forces of evil. Yeah, I think we see him the most activity. It seems like he's like either jogging running or boxing he, he's frustrated he's got a lot of emotions and is down on himself then to it's almost like he harnesses all of his frustration and puts it into this situation in some ways chris mcneil going to him is his salvation even though he does die you know like he absorbs the evil and then sacrifices himself there is a presence there like when you when he dies you're like oh man like if there was anybody in this scenario that would be the sacrifice, it's like clearly uh, Karis's character. And it all kind of makes sense. And it does make for not, it's a sad ending in some ways, but it's also a happy ending. It's, it's very odd. Like this movie has so many different feelings going on toward the end because you're kind of happy. You're kind of relieved that uh, this punishment that you've been put through as an audience is like seeing this <laughs> poor family suffer is like come to an end, but you're also like, Oh man, it ended in, you know, this guy's death that we've like grown to kind of love as a character. All right. We're going to move through the rest of the cast and we'll get to Linda Blair. Um, first Max von Sydow, who plays father Marin, probably the biggest name in this film. Um, definitely. I mean, he's, He's the guy you see looking up into Reagan's room on the Exorcist poster. And this was also, uh, I think I grew up watching this movie thinking that he was an 87-year-old man. He was 44 at the time of this uh, filming. I think his aging makeup is really wonderful, too. And and also keep in mind, when you are watching a 50-year-old movie that has been fully restored into 4K, Blu-ray, digital, the best picture you've ever seen you're going to see it in a way that it wasn't intended 50 years ago or that, you know, you, no one thought we could see at the time. But Max von Sydow really brings a grounding presence to this film, which in amongst all of this chaos, he's supposed to be the guiding light. He is the exorcist. He's the guy that's going to, along with Father Karras, hopefully rescue Reagan from the grips of the devil. When I was doing my first rewatch of this, when it gets to the higher ups talking about bringing Marin into the this family's life and doing the exorcism, it's done in almost a way that you would see later in a lot of action movies where they're like talking about how tough this character is and yeah. like pump it up and and they totally do that. Like you're like, man, this guy's you know, they're talking about him like he's the only one that we know that's had experience doing yeah. this. And when he pulls up, it's like you know, the shot they give him, this is the badass. This is the guy who's <laughs> going to, you know, kick the devil's ass. And even Reagan, like, demonically possessed Reagan's senses yeah. coming. So it's such a a strong presence in the movie. And it really, to me, like, when that car pulls up and he gets out, you know it's on. Like, here, this yeah. is the battle scene. This is the, we're in deep into third act. We're going to see everything go down there's a lot going on i mean he he has a very minimal amount of screen time but for what he does have um you do get the sense that this is his fight he plays it in like a very humble way you know even with all the projectile vomiting on him and you know gets on him and karis is like oh my gosh he like takes this thing takes it into the bathroom he's like trying to wash it you know marin is kind of is always trying to keep it like don't let this entity into your head. Don't listen to anything that the entity says. What we're doing here, just we have to focus on ourselves and we have to focus on the exorcism. Don't get caught up. Don't, you know, let your mind get messed with. And you do feel safer when he's there. You know, like it's the first time in the movie where you're in the room with Linda Blair's character and you don't feel like totally terrified after she's kind of gone downhill into her transition because his presence like kind of makes you feel like, okay, maybe this guy can do something. 
thankfully, because I do feel really helpless, even though I've seen this movie a billion times, feel very helpless at times in that room with Reagan. Now, while Max von Sydow was a fictional priest, there were two real-life priests that were involved as technical advisors and actors in this film. I already mentioned Father Tom Birmingham, who was William Peter Blatty's teacher in high school. He is who Father Karras meets to talk with in um, a bar scene and is someone who goes to lobby for the case that Father Karras is really, you know, overseeing this demonically possessed child. So it was kind of cool. Technical advisor and actor in the film and for not being an actor does a great job. Also, a little bit larger of a role was the role of Father Dyer, played by William O'Malley, another technical advisor, and he is Father Karras's kind of BFF. And I think he does a wonderful job here, too. He feels a, like very authentic in the, in the role of, I mean, basically probably playing himself. I also really appreciate the roles of Sharon Spencer, played by Kitty Wynn, who is Chris McNeil's, um, I guess, maid, live-in maid. Um, she doesn't get much screen time in this film, but she's always present with everything that's going on with Reagan. Um, definitely Chris's emotional support. I like that Sharon shows up in, even though it's not my favorite film, I like that she shows up in The Exorcist too. She's basically Reagan's, I mean, she's her overseer. And also Mrs. Karras, uh, played by Vasiliki Maliarios, who for having such a small role in this film, is completely all over it, is the reason for Father Karras's guilt and depression. I mean, the fact that she was discovered in a, in a Greek restaurant and that was very reminiscent of, of a woman from the old country, a, a very motherly figure that, um, I don't know, just the authenticity that she brings to this role. I absolutely love it so much. And I don't know how many, I have a friend named Jamie and I call her Jimmy. And I don't know how many times, oh, my, her nickname is Dimmy now. And I'll always say, why you do this to me, Dimmy? Why? Well, I think the <laughs> Karis visiting his mother in the sanitarium is like equally terrifying scene. I yes. mean, for other reasons, just because of the conditions and everybody's just, you know, seems to have completely lost their mind. And he just feels like totally helpless and totally upset about where his mom is at. And yeah, she does a great scene. It's like feels extremely authentic. You're like, are these people actually related? Because it really, it really seems like it. Now, we've got two other big names um, in this film before we get to Little Linda Blair. Yeah, there's uh, the director of the movie that is being shot, uh, played by Jack McGowan, who it, it almost feels like sort of the stereotypical sort of director with their head up their ass. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, doesn't care what he says, is very... Uh, unruly, you know, kind of shakes things up at the party. And we also have uh, Kinderman, who's, I think, my favorite character here, played by Lee J. Cobb. He he kind of works his way into the movie in a very odd way. I don't know if he's, like, kind of play like an idiot, you know, because he wants people to put their guard down, but then he's also, like, really in love with movies. And when he has the whole conversation with um, Karis about, like, do you love the cinema? Yeah. You know, talk about movies, criticism, film <laughs> criticism. And you're like, wait, what, what's happening? And then it turns out he wants uh, the Ellen Burstyn's character's autograph. He's there to kind of investigate. And, you know, it is it is a subplot. You know, he's a subplot character. And generally, I feel like this is a character that could go to the wayside and just be uninteresting. And he has all these, like, little idiosyncratic things that make you question, like, his motives and, like, what's he doing here? But... I do enjoy his character so much and I really, you know, I'm, the movie would be so much longer, but I almost wish that like there were more um, instances where he was further investigating what was going on. But I know that that wasn't the point of the movie that we want to get back to the Reagan character and what her struggle is. Do you think that Lieutenant Kinderman knows that Reagan killed Burke Dennings, that she threw him out the window? I believe that's 100% what he thinks, and he feels bad, but he's also kind of blinded by the fame of being in this uh, actress that he loves home, and he doesn't want to be rude in any ways, Very, but he also is like trying to find out like what really happened. It's such a unique scene because he's not accusing this woman's 12-year-old daughter of killing someone, um, but he's also fangirling out 
around her. It's a really it's a really wonderful scene. Yeah, and it, it takes its time and it's very unusual in the way it develops and then, you know, you find out like, oh, okay, okay, he's really, really into her films and like yeah. loves her movies and so there's a bit of a conflict in him doing this investigation. All right, it's time to get to one of the best performances of a child actor. I, I mean, I think of of any time that I can remember. Um, Ms. Linda Blair. And we'll talk about her as we discuss some of the special effects and makeup effects too, because as the movie progresses on, she's really put through some hell in this movie. And this, like all movies that have child actors, they're so dependent on how much a kid can work and like, what acting ability a kid's going to have and will it be believable and will it be too cutesy will it be too precocious even 50 years later like watching linda blair's performance in this i mean she starts out as like everyday ordinary kid who is happy and you know wants a little attention and then things start to slowly sour and she becomes like a shell of herself and you know and i think a lot of the performance is helped by the aid of special effects and different voice over you know when she her voice becomes the evil demonic voice but we do I do feel like it's like this great transition into her being a kid who's letting her mom know like hey something's wrong I don't feel good to slowly becoming this face that's like hard to look at it's like so scary and then when you get to see her at the end of the movie going back you know back as her normal self you're like, oh yeah, that's what she was like. I mean, because it's such a, there's, it feels like so much time has elapsed. You like forget like how lighthearted and spirited she was. And to see that at the end of the movie, you know, even though it's a tiny scene and she doesn't remember anything, you know, just gives you like that little bit of light, a little bit of hope. Um, And she does it so well. Linda Blair was 12, 13 years old when she did this movie. And um, the subject matter alone, I think would be hard for any uh, kid to, get into I mean not just being able to act it but being able to have the maturity to understand what's going on and the concepts of the characters and then all of this like religious and spiritual connotations that are going on and the morals of what she's going to be asked to do in this movie specifically the crucifix masturbation scene which even uh, watching it 50 years later is like I mean, I can't. I mean, it's shocking now. I can't imagine like what people thought watching this. Especially with "Let Jesus Fuck Me" being said over it. It's absolutely (laughs) just outrageous. And don't think that William Friedkin didn't check this girl's emotional stability. That was one of the first things was to make sure that whoever was going to be cast in this had some maturity about them. And Linda Blair's talent agency recommended like 50 some odd girls. She was not one of them. And it was actually Blair's mom that wanted her that pushed for this audition. She'd only ever done school plays. So when she went in for this audition, it was, you know, checking her emotional stability, check about her religious background and seeing if she could writhe around in pain and make it look believable. And one of the reasons that director Mike Nichols turned down the film was he thought that there wasn't ever going to be a child who could pull off this role. And I think to a degree, he's he's right. Linda Blair is a true rarity, I feel like, for The Exorcist, because someone who um, was of lesser talent would have kind of made this into like maybe a joke. I'm, uh, there's a lot of kids in movies nowadays that it's like I write them off because I'm just like meh don't really believe them but Blair said one of the reasons she was able to pull this off was that just kind of disassociating from it some of the content she wasn't really fully aware of what it was she knew the connotation a little bit behind it but she was able to disassociate and I don't think Friedkin pressured her into, you know, doing particular scenes that were uncomfortable. But, you know, some of the filthier dialogue, um, when she would read it, you know, she would say, oh, I can't say this. And Friedkin would talk to her and like, I don't think there was any bullying or anything, but um, he was able to help her through this performance. And I think she really does deliver in this performance and showing that Who Reagan McNeil is, is not the demon that we see later in the film, which also helps us as the audience identify with Chris, her mother, in saying that these are completely two different people. And also, 
when we get to the finale of the film, when Father Karras is beating her, like trying to beat the demon out of her, I kind of forget that it's a child, honestly. Maybe if it was a lesser actor or a lesser performance, it would be a little bit more bothersome um, because I am still affected at the crotch stabbing at the, I don't know, shoving your mother's face in your bloody crotch too. That's another thing that's really disturbing when you think about a 12-year-old. But when we get to the full demonically possessed Reagan and he's beating the ever-loving crap out of her, I'm more like, yes, do whatever you have to do to get rid of that demon. We have to give credit to the special effects here because if they didn't make her look non-childlike anymore, I think it would be (laughs) really hard to watch that scene. But the... Special effects do such a good job of like transforming her into what looks like a monster. I mean, it's there's times where when she first turns, when you first see that evil face with like the cuts and the nicks and like the evil eyes, um, and like vomit on her shirt, it's really hard to in almost like a the way she's like breathing and there's like you can see her breath and it doesn't look like a child anymore. And thank goodness because yes, the I think it would be harder to watch that exorcism scene if you were looking at a little girl not this like monster in which she became and linda blair's performance certainly was aided by the performance of a stunt double uh, eileen Dietz. she's on screen i think it was uh later determined for 28.2 seconds um is she shown on screen a lot of times we see her from the back um, but any time that you maybe it doesn't look a little bit like reagan that's most likely eileen Dietz. And from the point that Reagan uh, delivers the wonderful line, let Jesus fuck me, that is the voice of Mercedes McCambridge, who was a 40s actress that William Freakin pulled out of like the recesses of his mind and remembered her particular voice, someone that wasn't necessarily overly feminine, someone that wasn't masculine. It was like this nice, neutral voice and invited her to be part of this production and I think it was three weeks of she was uh, I, I think she was an ex-alcoholic ex-smoker and during those three weeks she drank copious amounts of whiskey chain smoked freaking said like three packs a day and I don't know if she gargled with like raw eggs or what it was but it was like a whole disgusting process in order to create that demon voice that you hear. And I think it in the beginning, it is a little bit of Blair and McCambridge's voice together, but eventually it's not. It's just Mercedes McCambridge from then on. Yeah, the sound of that voice, once it enters into your mind and is there to almost to the end of the film, is is very, very creepy. I mean, I think that's a big part of what makes the movie so scary yeah. is that voice coming out of this little girl's mouth. Yeah. Another frightening aspect coming out of little Reagan's mouth is, you know, maybe that tongue lengthening too. that little creepy, creepy thing that happens thanks to uh, Dick Smith, makeup effects supervisor and special effects, practical effects master uh, Marcel Vugate. These guys are completely uh, responsible for so many people having nightmares after seeing The Exorcist. They are the ones that basically Dick Smith handled everything kind of on the outside, the makeup aspects, and Marcel was doing all of the internal mechanics. So when you've got the, you know, the Reagan dummy with the head spinning, everything on the outside, Dick Smith, everything that made that head completely turn around and that model look creepily real uh, was Marcel. Together combining forces along with their special effects crew, of course, doing things like what might seem like pretty run of the mill these days. You can add in breath, you know, nowadays into film with not even thinking about it, normal temperature room. Well, in 1973, you couldn't do that. So they took four air conditioning units and completely sealed this room, this set, and refrigerated the set overnight to where it was well below freezing, to where everyone except poor little Linda Blair um, were dressed in warm clothes because it was completely frigid in that room. These were the guys responsible for creating scenes like that. And the director of photography, Owen Roisman, who worked on The French Connection with Friedkin, he'd brought him to this production with the breath to I never even thought about this. Not only do you need it to be cold enough to see breath, but to know how to light it. And it is lit from 
whether it's underneath, over to the side, being able to create that to where it not only shows up that you can see it, you and I can see it right in front of you, but to have it show up on film is is no small feat. And I love bringing up the Reagan dummy, the the rotating head. Not only do I think it looks really cool, but just the fact that they're able to obscure so much um, like the fact that the head turns around is obscured by her hair. It's pretty simple, but that effect is, I mean, completely haunting. And I think her head turns twice. I think it turns around twice, not a complete 360. And William Peter Blatty, though he completely acknowledges it, that audiences love that part in the movie, he was initially PO'd about it because he was like, listen, this might be supernatural, but it doesn't mean it's impossible, man. You don't have to have her head turned completely around. I think that both of these instances, it's very effective. And it's also one of the only times that optical effects are employed for this. Um, There's a really haunting, terrible moment where we see the dummy of Reagan and half of her face kind of looks like it's alive. That's the overlay of Eileen Dietz um, in that kind of demon Pazuzu makeup, which wasn't even really supposed to be included in the film. I think it was a makeup test that Friedkin kind of shelved that it wasn't really going to work for the film. But that was one of the things that they put in in order to make not only that face be creepier, but to make it have two different kind of lives within that face. I also like, too, that just the head turning in context of the movie, you know, we hear Kinnerman talk about how the director, when he fell down the stairs, they're like, the only strange thing about it is his head is turned completely all the way around, which seems very uh, impossible, you know, the way he yeah. fell down the stairs. And then when that happens on screen with her head, you know, even though we suspect that she's the cause of his death by pushing him out the window. When Reagan is in that half Linda Blair, half dummy, that part is uh, probably my favorite line. Justin, you've heard me say this line a couple times and it's been living with me for the past month where it's the character of Brooke Denning's voice coming out of, of Reagan and says to poor Chris McNeil, who's been slapped on the floor, do you know what she did, your cunting daughter? It's terrifying, but do I laugh every single time? And I don't laugh out of hilarious. It is terrifying. It's awful. And you know that it's immediately Brooke Denning's voice, too. I don't know. Just everything about that scene, the head spinning, um, makes it so much creepier. And they did a test run to see before anything was filmed to see how creepy um, the dummy was. And I guess they had it set up in a taxi cab just like to see if people, you know, were passing it in New York, had it in a taxi cab and people were creeped out, like looking at it, like side eyeing it. And then when the head was made to turn and look at the person next to them, people were screaming as they were passing the car. So that was their uh, litmus test on if this dummy was going to work or not. And the uh, projectile vomiting, they used a pea soup and uh, had like a nozzle hooked up to like shoot it out. It was pretty crafty how it was it, done. It, though. it was, and it doesn't it it it's aged really well and is still pretty disgusting. You know, it's just uh, that you'd have this like sort of weird green liquid um, that would come out of you know doesn't seem like a normal thing that you would projectile vomit. <laughs> so it just makes it all the more strange and unsettling. It was this like plastic facial mouth harness that if you think about like a horse bit, it's kind of what it was that had um, the tube running into the mouth and then shooting out from inside the mouth. But both the bladders of the warm pea soup were on either side of the cheeks of the actor's cheeks and were obscured by the really intense heavy makeup. Um, this scene was done a couple times. And the first time that the pea soup shot out of mouth uh, hit Jason Miller straight in the face, which is what we see in the film. And you see him recoil and he looks, I mean, he looks mad and, and disgusted and everything. They didn't want to use that take first because it's not that he breaks character, but it is like a very like revolting look and he wasn't supposed to get hit in the eye and directly right there. And so they did try it um, a couple different ways. And in the end, that was the shot that they went with but poor jason miller and 50 years later i mean all these effects still look good to me you know i think this was a time period too where there were special effects throughout horror movies leading up to the exorcist but i think 
The Exorcist for like a well-budgeted studio film. Again, you spend all this time building the characters and then for like the last 35 or 40 minutes, you're getting sort of a special effects extravaganza of like grossness and like creepiness and a lot of artistry that makes you believe that this little girl is a monster. The makeup effects too started out way more monstrous for Linda Blair um, to where she didn't really even look like there was a child underneath. And there, I, I think you can find on the internet like a bunch of photos of different makeup setups that Dick Smith did for um, the possessed Reagan. But in the end, um, all of these monster effects just didn't sit well with Friedkin. And it was kind of like what we see now looks more like self-harm that this girl has harmed herself it's you know this demon that's that's scarring her and that she's you know basically rotting away like there's some gangreneness to her um but that was one of the later makeup effects and i think i'm so happy that they went with this kind of rotting corpse abused child look versus uh more monstrous effects that would have taken me out of the movie i, t- I totally agree yeah, yeah. Well, the abuse didn't stop there for the makeup effects. I think Ellen Burstyn said that Friedkin was a little too extreme in his not aggressive. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, A little too pushy about how to get the desired performances out of actors, whether it was willingly or against their will. Yeah, very extreme way to get reaction out of an actor. Um, uh, for instance, firing off shotguns to keep people on edge. That's not, you know, No. <laughs> it's like, what's happening? You know, certainly you hear these stories of these directors who did like extreme things to actors. And, you know, The Exorcist was a huge success and the acting is really good in it. But Ellen Burstyn is great in other movies where they weren't firing shotguns off and like uh, hurting her back by like yanking her, you and, know, with a rope. And not just like that. So this is the scene after Reagan shoves her face in her crotch and then she backhands her across the room. Well, obviously, Linda Blair didn't actually backhand her across the room. She was yanked. And I mean, they did this scene a couple times. And each time, like, Ellen Burstyn was like, "Okay, I think we got it. Friedkin wasn't happy about it. It needed to be a little bit more. Ellen Burstyn said, "Okay, one more. And that's it. And that was when Friedkin mouthed um, to the special effects guys, "Okay, give it to her. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you, she just said, I, it, you're hurting my back, and now you're going to, like, make this one count, I guess. So the take that we see in the movie, Ellen Burstyn really does fly off of her feet because she's yanked so hard. And when you see her grab her back, um, she really was injured. Not to say that everything Freakin' did was wrong. You know, he has a lot of talent, Um, A lot of the decisions that he made with The Exorcist made it the film it is, Um, you know, wanting to make this a very specific movie that doesn't rely on just scares and, you know, takes you into this world, like treat it as if this is a, you know, historical document. There's a lot to be said for that. But yeah, his his a lot of his methods were pretty extreme. I think that he got less that way, you know, as he got older, but he was sort of like, I'm going to live and die by my art kind of director who demanded, you know, I want it to be perfect or I want it to be um, authentic or else I can't end this day or I'm going to be just like destroyed. And he didn't care if uh, somebody was upset by that. You know, he very much was like, I'm the director. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. And not to say uh, that that isn't a method that is um, unsuccessful because it it was for this movie and um, even the untrained actor playing the priest at the end uh couldn't cry on cue and so um William freaking slapped him across the face to get him worked up and get his emotions worked up and it you know it worked for the scene but uh you know you hear a story like that and you're like god you know yeah there was uh but that was his solution and he did what he had to do I guess I'm not condoning anything that went <laughs> down on the set And William O'Malley said that, you know, he was tired by the time that that final take happened. The final take is what we see in the movie. Um, But you see his hands shaking as he's holding Father Karras's dying hand. He said, my hands weren't shaking because I, you know, was acting. I was genuinely shaken up because I just got slapped in the face. And one more thing that 
wasn't necessarily Friedkin's fault. I don't think it was anybody's fault necessarily, but since we're talking hits and injuries here, Linda Blair did have her back hurt as well in the, you know, infamous thrashing back and forth, back and forth on the bed before everything really goes to hell for poor little Reagan. Her body was affixed to like a metal, like a steel plate. So that's what was catapulting her forward and jerking her back. And at some point, the straps came loose. So as her body was going forward and it was then getting jerked back onto the metal plate and then the metal plate was hitting her back as well as pushing her forward. So when you hear her say, make it stop, that was her line in the movie, but she wasn't joking. She really wanted it to stop. Again, we're seeing someone get injured on screen in front of us. Yeah, I can't imagine how painful that was. I guess at least for uh, Linda Blair, she was younger than Ellen Burstyn, so maybe uh, she wasn't like psychologically scarred as deep. Hopefully not, but yeah. all of those scenes, I mean, you can see the pain, and I think that that adds to the realness of it. Not that I'm advocating for Friedkin's unorthodox methods of uh, getting a performance out of out of an actor, but there, there's something I got to bring up with him when we go to uh, the third discussion, but uh, we'll wait till we get to the release reception area. Yeah, let's go to another clip from Exorcist and then we'll come back. We'll get into release reception and those sequels and the music, all that kind of jazz. So much more. Especially important is the warning to avoid conversations with it even. We may ask what is relevant, but anything beyond that is dangerous. He's a liar. The demon is a liar. He will like to confuse us. But he will also mix lies with the truth to attack us. The attack is psychological, Damien. And powerful. So don't listen. Remember that. Do not listen. Well, I wanted to first uh, bring up the music of this movie. I feel like this was a, a little bit of a transitional period in horror movies where... Um, Prior to The Exorcist, and don't get me wrong, this isn't like the first movie that did it, but prior to The Exorcist, you know, we had a lot of the more dramatic music that kind of told you something sinister was happening, yeah. you know, like the dun, 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 yeah. that kind of <laughs> stuff, or like, you know, or even like Psycho, you know, awesome score, but like cueing that like, this is crazy, you know, even though what's going on screen is crazy, we don't This is it. when the that, horror is happening. Exactly, yeah, and The Exorcist had this like very creepy toned music that was driving but wasn't you know it it let you know that something ominous was happening and something was building but it wasn't so on the nose like mickey mousey as far as like taking a jab at the audience and like making them say like you need to know this is frightening and that was friedkin's intention with the music behind this he said this numerous times that he wanted the music to feel like a cold hand on the back of your neck which is you know supposed to be something that's haunting chill there's there's always this pervasive idea that something's coming not necessarily you know a monster or something coming for you but there's always something following you and that really happens with the score originally he had tapped Lalo Schifrin to do the score with a kind of traditional sense of um, a big orchestra and I guess Schifrin had worked on this for weeks and when it came time to record it and Friedkin was there this orchestra I mean everyone assembled for this and they started recording it and Friedkin while they were recording stopped them took what had been recorded and literally threw it out a window um the man is incredibly dramatic what an asshole I know it's it's a pretty dick move I would like to know what that score would sound like, you know, just as a lover of this movie, just to hear um, an orchestral score throughout this movie. But the fact that it is minimal and that Jack Nietzsche was the musical supervisor behind this movie, I think it makes it creepier. There are a lot of noises and um, I mean, that's basically what it is. There's only one like kind of string of music and that's the Mike Oldfeld's Tubular Bells, which... Friedkin just happened to find when uh, when talking to producer Larry Marks, he directed him to just go through like some um, pieces that hadn't been used for everything. And that's where we get the signature exorcist uh, haunting theme that I love so much. And it is if I had a haunted house, I would have it on consistently. 
And while Friedkin didn't want to serve the meaning of this movie to the audience like on a platter, um, he did the same thing with the score too. Uh, We have so many instances where there's calm and silence in the film and then it's completely interrupted by something dramatic. You know, we have one scene where nothing's happening and then the next Linda Blair's flailing back and forth in bed or, you know, the next dramatic scene and he wanted it to go basically from silence to loud, from nothing happening to extreme, to keep the audience on edge. And that extreme sense, I think, really um, pushes the movie along until we finally do get the climax of the film, which feels different than the rest of the movie. Yeah, I do like that there's these moments. It's like a really good choice of like letting things get quiet, letting the story build without, again, like driving the audience with the music of like, how they're supposed to feel emotionally about these characters. And if you listen closely to a lot of the noises that are mixed in with the music, there are things like rats running in a box and hamsters in a cage, bees buzzing, dogs fighting. When you isolate the sound, you can hear it, whether it's fake fingernails being clacked together, just random animal noises. You can hear it, but when you mix it all together, it makes for a really uh, just unnerving sense for this film. Well, as we've been doing the... uh research for this movie i'm learning more and more that freaking was kind of a maniac maniac and <laughs> someone that was hard to work with with every step of the way you know he's getting to fights with people during production very questionable uh ideas about how to direct a scene and how to work with actors throwing out a score that a bunch of people spent a lot of time and hard work on and of course when they get to the editing stage of the exorcist you know he's going toe-to-toe with bladdies and the editors on how the movie should be cut and how the story should be um, curated with all their footage. And yeah, he was just a guy that if like he didn't like something, he was like ready to, you know, rip your head off. And so we do get this other version that's cut, you know, the, there's a theatrical cut. And then 20 years later, there was the, you know, quote unquote version that you've never seen that was released in theaters. And it's like, tw- like almost 30 years later, wasn't it? Yeah, this is like 73 to 2000. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. And and I remember that coming out. I was working at a movie theater and thinking, uh, and that was back before they did like retro movies all the time. Like now that, you know, just about every theater is showing The Exorcist once a year. But like at that time, it was like really busy. Like people were super pumped to come out and see The Exorcist and see all this like unreleased footage that they had never seen. Some parts of it are scarier and kind of more effective in the version that you've never seen. But um, yeah, there was like a lot of tension in the editing room uh, when they went to cut the original version that uh, was released theatrically. And maybe it had something to do with it, the editing happening at 666 Fifth Street in New York. You know, that couldn't, not to put any weight on that, but come on, it is kind of funny. Um, yeah, Friedkin, his original first cut of this was 140 minutes, and which Blatty saw and was pretty stoked about. I think for the most part, that is what ended up being the version you've never seen with some things I think taken out. For the most part, that is the version that came out in 2000. Uh, I don't think everything was included in the 2000 version, but Blatty was excited about this 140 minute version of The Exorcist. But Friedkin thought it was kind of lagging in some areas and he wanted to cut it down for pacing and he had it in his head that a movie shouldn't be over two hours. So he knew that Blatty was going to be a problem. Um, So he, God, William Friedkin, man. Um, He had Blatty banned from the Warner lot and editing suite so he couldn't get involved with editing. Now, even though these guys remained friends throughout the years, Friedkin said that every chance he got, Blatty would tell him how wrong he was about making all of these cuts. And he was super pissed about it. And I think from Blatty's point of view, he had been struggling with his source material being tampered with like the whole time. People wanting to manipulate the story however they wanted to, which I mean, that does happen when you when you sell your story. But I think that this was his worst nightmare really was that the version that he saw was not going to be the final cut 
Now, Freakin admitted, um, I think it was in 1998, when they were in talks about doing the version you've never seen, he does admit, you know, 25 years later, okay, maybe I was a little rash about making some of these cuts. I'm someone that likes the, the newer version, and it includes some scenes that are scarier than what was originally, I think, intended for The Exorcist, like the spider walk. I love that friggin' scene. It's absolutely terrifying seeing Linda Blair and... Um, a gymnast stunt double on their back going down the stairs. But the reason, um, for those of you who have seen this, there was no way to include that in the original because the wires that were holding the back of that actor, um, there wasn't a way to cut around them at the time. But in 1998, 2000, they could remove those. Blatty's biggest complaint about what was cut out of the film was a conversation that happens in the midst of the exorcism climax between Father Karras and Father Marin, where they're talking about, like, basically the meaning behind the movie. And Friedkin does admit that when he shot that scene, he knew that he was going to cut it out because he felt that it was handing too much to the audience and basically telling you how you're supposed to feel about this film. But to Blatty, this was the point. This is why you were watching this film. And seeing that scene in the 2000 version, I kind of love it. It is just kind of a conversation piece, but having that moment between Marin and Karis, uh, when in the original version, we pretty much just see them in the room together. We don't have a private moment where they're, I mean, really taking in the the weight of what's happening. So I think everything that was added in and even the, you know, quote unquote, subliminal messages um, or subliminal images that were added into the 2000 version. I mean, I kind of love it. I think it adds a lot to it. The original is wonderful, and that's what we're talking about. But um, if you've never seen this version, it's certainly worth it. And Blatty also thought that a lot of audience members, when they saw the original, thought that the devil won. Friedkin, on the other hand, he thought that there was no way anyone could uh, come out of the movie thinking that. But I don't know. Honestly, when I first saw The Exorcist, I was left on not an uplifting note. I mean, sure, Reagan was okay now. Um, but uh, I don't know, Justin, when you see Father Karras's hand when he's like dying and grips Father Dyer's hand, I always thought that the way that he holds his hand, like it looks like, okay, he's dying. Sure. But it looks kind of like, it looks a little evil. I don't know. That's always the way that I took it was that, you know, is the demon dying or is he just, I don't know. I'm not saying that I dislike the way that it ended, but seeing the 2000 version, it ends on a much more positive note. Yeah, I mean, there's something unsettling completely in both versions. Yeah. But yeah, I do agree. There's more of a, it it ends on more of an up note than... Up note, not positive, up, yeah. Yeah. So The Exorcist was released the day after Christmas, 1973. Perfect, yeah. Which is, uh, (laughs) you know, seems like an unusual time to release a movie like this. You would have thought that they would have... uh, hit the October Halloween season. But I think that the idea was, is like, this isn't just like a B horror movie. This is like a prestigious film by a prestigious director who just like swept the last Oscars with French connection. And this movie was like more than a hit. It's hard to really describe 50 years ago, a movie, you know, now movies all the time make like hundreds of million dollars opening weekend. You know, they, they didn't put, movies like in thousands of theaters at once back then like there was like a slow build and there was no internet or anything you know it was like all word of mouth spread and so this movie I think was only released in like less than 50 theaters when it was released word of mouth grew I was asking my mom about this when this movie came out and this was like one of those movies where like people were taking their teenagers and like they were waiting in line for two hours and people couldn't believe what they saw, like coming out of the theater saying, this is messed up, this movie, you know, and people wanting to just go see what all the talk was about, like rumors spread about the movie and how it was made. And ultimately the movie was like blockbuster, like pre star Wars, pre close encounters, pre jaws. This movie made like over $400 million at the box office. And this is when tickets were probably like $3 a yeah. piece. So you can imagine how many people actually went and saw this movie when it was released. It was quite a impressive success. I mean, it's nuts. You think that an event film, you know, things are promoted as an event film before they even come out now. This really turned into a phenomenon. And it's no exaggeration that people were 
vomiting and fainting and running out of the theater screaming. I can't really believe things like having miscarriages, like, but these were ideas, you know, having heart attacks in the theater. I don't know if I believe the extreme medical, you know, ideas, but there were people that were running to church after this or questioning their own faith. Yeah. It was causing people to look inwardly at themselves. And this might have even been one of the first films where people blamed. um, And I think this was like a year later when this started happening, where people committed a crime and blamed it on seeing The Exorcist. Take that for what it's worth. But I mean, this movie was causing a reaction in the people that saw it. Yeah. And just like mass hysteria from audiences, uh, whether it be positive or negative. But the movie was... I mean, I think overall, like, received positively Mm -hmm. and critically definitely received positively. Critics were happy about the fact that it was this scary, exciting movie, but also, like, dealt with, like, faith and had solid characters and a solid story. It wasn't just all about the effects, but the effects were, you know, noted as being, like, this is a new level of, like, what they can put up on screen and have people believe it. The reaction from the religious community was... I think for the most part positive, but there were the extreme folks like the well-known Southern Baptist minister, Billy Graham, who said that this was a power of evil in every fabric of this film. Uh, And then you had many priests who thought that this film was a force of good, which I think is lost on some folks who do watch this film, who do have um, a lot of, you know, faith that they can miss the point of this movie that, I mean, you and I have talked about this off the mic, Justin, that this isn't a movie about evil winning. If anything, I've come to see this movie as not pro-religion, but pro-God in a way. Not, yeah. And like no matter, or maybe even pro-faith. Definitely pro-faith, I feel like is a is what this movie ultimately is when you walk away from it. You... Yeah. I retract pro-God. It's pro-faith. Um, and you can take that however you want. But whenever someone recently at work, this happened to me that um, someone who is very religious, I brought up The Exorcist and they said, oh, that's the one of the worst movies ever made. And I'm like, OK, you're really religious and you think The Exorcist sucks, even though it's like one of the most you know, well-renowned movies out there. This has to mean that you miss the point of The Exorcist. In my lifetime, I've known several people that I wouldn't say are like, you know, go to church every week, but they are more faith based and religious based and like just kind of all together avoid any kind of devil type movies. You know, it's just a genre that they just kind of stay away from. And I, I get that. I respect that. But again, I think this movie, there's people that won't watch it, but if you, it, to me, again, like you said, it's very, it's pro-faith. It's a movie that makes you question. I think we said this in the beginning, if, if you don't believe in God, but you believe evil exists, then God can exist. And if God can conquer evil, I mean, there, there you know, there's a circle there and, yeah. and there's, you know, and then there is a fear. And I mean, I think not to get into like a religious discussion, but you know, a lot of religious beliefs are based in fear, you know, yeah. I mean, and yeah. a lot of it, the fear of the unknown is a way to, get a big group of people to, you know, agree to something is because they're afraid of something. And I think this movie tackles a lot of those um, idealisms. So there was so much of a reaction that Friedkin considered re-releasing the film um, with a different ending, which blows my mind. And I'm not talking about the 2000 version. I'm talking like shortly after the movie was released. He thought about recutting it where Father Dyer's walking up the Hitchcock stairs, like where Father Karras, you know, infamously rolls down and dies, and Karras's spirit ascends through him, signifying that Father Karras has found his salvation. So that was one idea. Or that Father Dyer meets this random jogger who's embodied with the spirit of Father Karras, and then the sky becomes full of lights, and it's to, you know, so you know that Father Karras is, is okay. And he's redeemed himself. One, I can't imagine re-releasing this movie like a year afterwards with a different ending to make it more positive. But it does show that Friedkin at the time was thinking, okay, maybe I could have cut it a little differently. But it only took 27 years to uh, actually redo that. But I also like that he didn't pull a George Lucas and he's like, I'm going to release this new version that I wanted. And then like just try to like dismantle the old version that people loved and like make it disappear. Yeah. Um, You know, we can still watch either version of the exorcist 
very easily it's available readily available yeah and this movie was given a mild r rating at the time because there's no overt sex excessive violence a lot of people thought that it should have received an x rating which it did in britain and for many many years um, home sales of the exorcist became illegal in the uk which i mean you know different country i don't live in the uk but there have been films that have been banned here sure but in 1998 that was rescinded funny enough the exorcist was banned in tunisia for promoting christianity so they didn't miss the point really in tunisia not that it's promoting christianity but it's promoting you know i mean kind of in yeah, a way there wasn't a number to call when the movie ended or anything but <laughs> yeah so despite all of this controversy and all of these extreme reactions the exorcist was praised and received i think it was like 10 nominations like best picture actress actor supporting actor director cinematography art direction and film editing it won for writing and best sound which yes i mean across the board and that doesn't surprise me as we've seen historically the academy doesn't really recognize this genre you yeah. know every now and then a movie will sneak in there like sounds of lambs but again they're generally not what we would consider all out, you know, scary movies or the horror genre. Now, even though this movie was super duper successful at the box office, it was riddled with so much controversy and lawsuits, though I feel like that's par for the course when it comes to anything that becomes like a phenomenon where nobody was expecting it to be this successful. There's always some sort of controversy, it seems like, where someone's yeah. like, I didn't get credited for this. If this movie wasn't successful, would there be controversy? Probably not, because people would be like, ah, no one cares about this movie, so I don't care that I'm not getting paid for something. But when a movie is printing money, everybody wants to get their piece. And I think there was a lot of that that was happening behind the scenes after the success of this movie, as well as uh, I know you found a lot of information of freaking kind of like fueling the fire of like rumors and misinformation uh, that, you know, people started talking about and he was kind of like the person who started some of what was going on or like making matters worse. What a little stinker. I mean, Friedkin, I'm thankful that there haven't been worse things that have come out about him, but man, the um, whole controversy and all of the rumors behind this movie, William Friedkin, he's kind of guilty of pumping some of these things up. The most significant one that held a lot of weight was saying that Linda Blair was the only one who performed the the role of Reagan, that she had no substitutes, no stand-ins, which was, of course, not true. The Academy Awards hadn't happened yet. Linda Blair was a pretty high contender for Best Supporting Actress. But when it came out that Friedkin was saying that she didn't have anybody else performing her role, Mercedes McCambridge and Eileen Dietz sued the production. And with their lawsuits, then this called Linda Blair's reputation into question. And a lot of people say that this was part of the reason that she didn't win for Best Supporting Actress that year. This controversy got so big that in Eileen Dietz's lawsuit, she claimed that she performed all of the possession scenes, every single bit of it, which led to Warner Brothers going frame by frame to show just how much time Eileen Dietz is on camera. And at the, I had no idea that um, this was called the the Great Pea Soup War at the time. I mean, just just the fact that this was happening shows that your movie is massive. Like you said, uh, when something's huge, then that's when everyone comes out of the woodwork. But I do think Mercedes McCambridge and Eileen Dietz had a completely valid lawsuit, even though that was probably the biggest one that actually affected Linda Blair. Friedkin also was part of uh, this kind of disinformation campaign of not telling the media how things were done and being really elusive and evasive about how, you know, the levitation scene, people would ask, how was that possible? And he actually said something about using a magnetic field. And I mean, that's not how they did it. It had nothing to do with, had to do with wires and like fake walls. Uh, had absolutely nothing to do with magnetic fields. And then um, regarding Reagan's head spinning around, not saying that it was a dummy that was used because it is really authentic looking. He was quoted as saying, any way you think it was done was not the way that we did it. Like, come on, dude, but just say that it was a dummy. Why you gotta, why you gotta pump it up like that? And then another rumor that he helped spread, and I can't disprove this, but after learning 
how much disinformation he put out there. Um, he claimed to have used sounds uh, from the actual 1949 exorcism that the Vatican had and that he mixed that into the film. I don't know if I really believe that. I kind of don't now. And I did when he, you know, of course said this and then learning all of these things that he was trying to mislead people along the way. I feel like the Vatican would have had a problem with that too. And then the one thing that everyone talks about when you bring up The Exorcist is how the production was cursed and all of these terrible things happened and people died. I mean, there were people that died. Jack McGowan, who played Burke Dennings, he did die after all of his scenes uh, were filmed. Max von Sydow's brother died. Linda Blair's grandfather died. Jason Miller's son was in a motorcycle accident. He survived. A gaffer cut his fingers off. Of course, we already know about Ellen Burstyn and Linda Blair's backs being injured. There was part of a set at the Seco Studios that burned down. There were some terrible things that happened during the production. One of the cameraman's babies died. Like, okay. But as Blatty said, this movie was in production for a year. There's a lot of things that happen just in life. And it's not saying that there's necessarily a curse. When you look back on it and you put all of these things together, you're like, oh, yeah, that is, that's crazy. There, there must have been evil on the set, but come on. A year's a really long time. Yeah, I think we kind of went into this territory with the poltergeist uh, yeah. episode. And, you know, it's like a lot of unfortunate mishaps, you know, and uh, events in people's lives. But yeah, when you put them all together, it's easy to kind of just label it like, oh, the movie was cursed. But, you know, like you said, in any given year, a lot can happen. Traumatic things can happen. I guess I shouldn't call William Friedkin a, a stinker for being misleading about trying to promote this movie. I mean, you know, I fell for it with the Blair Witch Project, so maybe it was just a great marketing tool, but I can't help but, in hindsight, a little bit um, go, okay, dude, you were you were really trying to pull a fast one, but it worked. And I don't think that William Friedkin was, you know, an asshole by nature. I think he was just a very determined guy who had a vision and had his methods that he knew he could uh, create that vision with. Um, I don't think that there was necessarily, I, I would never call it abuse what happened. There have certainly been directors, I mean, Alfred Hitchcock had his problems. I would say that there are directors that have been much more problematic than William Friedkin, but um, he was certainly a colorful character and I'm glad I know a lot more about him now. Absolutely. So I wanted to briefly, briefly talk about the Exorcist franchise. I didn't want to spend too much time on it because we already did an entire episode on Exorcist 3, which I recommend going to check out. That's a movie that we do truly love and I yeah. think was a great sequel to the original film. Exorcist 2, The Heretic. I have heard about this movie for decades and I never actually sat down and watched it. I've only heard negative things about this movie and I got a copy, sat down and tried to keep an open mind and wow, I don't have a lot to say positive about this movie so I won't say much. Directed it, by John Borman who did Deliverance. Yeah, I mean I was really expecting it to be this sort of like is there something that maybe went over people's heads or like, you know, it was overshadowed by The Exorcist. I think it's just like flat out like a really uneven bad movie that they tried to shy away from you know I, I respect the fact that they tried to do something different they're like this isn't going to be so much about exorcism but we're going to try to extend the story into something else but it just is pretty boring it's pretty stiff there's not really anything um interesting going on it's just like a bunch of like therapy sessions and you know and some uneven story about basically the catholic church trying to not have a bad get a bad rap from the events of the first film and all of that it was like inconsequential to the plot it was just like sort of felt like it was just kind of shoved in there as a subplot throughout the movie yeah as far as watching this um as an extension from The Exorcist. I'm glad that I finally watched it in its entirety. I've only caught clips of it before, but it just feels like a whole different movie. Um, I also think that Linda Blair's direction, I think she's a better actor than what's in this film, and I don't think that she had the material to work with. Certainly, the climax of this, if you compare it to the original climax of the film, is 
so lame. It doesn't feel inspired, honestly. It, it feels like it's trying to be a little derivative of the original, especially towards the end. But the story itself just, I don't know, I just wasn't into it. And I could I could be into the whole like getting into one's mind and like this experimental idea of not repressed memories, but kind of, um, I can get into that idea. It just wasn't inspired. And even when we go into these kind of hallucinatory visions of what's going on inside people's minds, trying to find the root of this demon possession or Pazuzu, the, the ultimate evil devil creature. Um, it just wasn't, um, it wasn't scary. You know? Yeah, and, and there's just there's just wasn't an interesting character to be had that yeah. would get you involved in going for the ride of this movie. But I think if you're going to, if you're someone who's a completist, The Heretic and then Exorcist Three, they're completely different sequels than the original, and also completely independent of each other. So if you're someone that's a completist, watch all of it and you can, you know, make your own determination. I'm not sad that I watched The Heretic. I'm glad I did. Um, I'm glad that Linda Blair went on to have, you know, a career that went beyond this and, you know, that The Heretic didn't completely bomb her career. But, you know, I'm glad Exorcist 3 exists. And after Exorcist 3, we talked a little bit about these prequels uh, in the Exorcist 3 episode. Uh, there was a, a prequel that was made, Exorcist Dominion, that Paul Schrader was hired to direct, and then he was removed from the project, and Rennie Harlan shot more footage, used the footage that existed, and they put out sort of a fairly lame prequel, and then a year later, Schrader got his version to come out, so there's like two versions exist. Side by side, neither one of them are really worth talking about too much but it was interesting that that was made um but the exorcist to me was just never really like this like solid franchise which made me um really shocked to read that sony pictures paid 400 million dollars for the rights of the franchise because they were going to make three of these exorcist kind of like a direct sequel with the first being directed by david gordon green who did the direct sequel three Halloween movies and success at the box office. I don't know success with fans, but um, try, you know, they tried to use that same thing with the exorcist. And I think to even lesser uh, acclaim than he did with the Halloween series. And something like Halloween, that to me, that's something that you can make sequels to easily, whether you think they suck or, or, or worthy. The exorcist by itself has always just seemed like such a solitary movie. And that's why I think three is so wonderful because I look at that as a solitary movie too. It doesn't really have that much to do with the first one other than Lieutenant Kinderman, but that's really it. And I'm glad the heretics there. It's cool if people want to be inspired by the original exorcist, but I think there's a reason that everything that's come after the third one and the heretic to some degree, even though it tried to be a little different, Um, I think that that's why The Exorcist to me is always going to stand alone by itself. Oh yeah, in the third one, that's right, Father Karras is involved too. I forgot about that. But the way that he's involved is so elusive and imaginative. And that's why I feel like, again, even though you're involving characters from the original, it's still its own standalone movie. Yeah. And to me, three is the most enjoyable movie out of, you know, if I was going to sit down, if you had me right now and said, you're going to, you have to sit down and watch one of The Exorcist movies. I would pick three because um, though I love the original, I I feel like there's a lot of it that it's an intense movie. Whereas like three has an element of like uh, there's more scares, but it's more of a fun, you know, it's like a serial killer movie slash exorcist movie slash. We're also, you know, getting into some of the characters from the original, but not in a way that feels uh, just shoehorned in. So, in other words, go back and listen to our Exorcist 3 episode if you've not seen the movie. I guess uh, it's kind of telling if we did that before we did The Exorcist. Totally. I agree. Well, let's stop there. Uh, We'll come back for a little bit of talk on The Exorcist at the end of this episode, but we know this is a long one, so we're going to scoot into our picks of the week, which we both did Friedkin picks. Lindsay, you went with a movie that I really enjoyed, and I think one of... uh, 
a great late career Friedkin movie, and that's Bug. What can you tell me about that? I have a love-hate relationship with a phenomenon of paranoia. On one hand, growing up with the paranoia of X-Files shaped me for nine formative years, and I'm forever thankful for that show in my youth. And conversely, though, in my adult years, I've watched paranoia consume people close to me. If paranoia and government control is triggering for you, throw in a dash of drug addiction metaphors, this William Friedkin movie might be a lot to take on. With all that said, and this being my first watch, Bug was such a stellar film. This 2006 dingy dive into seedy Oklahoma life is minimal and focused in cast and setting and its scope of story direction, so when it starts out at a lesbian bar with Ashley Judd as a server, this is immediately disarming to me. Bug stays within the confines of this bar, but primarily at a nearby motel, which happens to be the residence of Judd's character, Aggie or Agnes. Though we're clued into an existing paranoia of Agnes having an obsessive, unnamed caller, we understand her to be one who is gritty, brash, tired, worn out, but also has kind of an open heart, which she has with her lesbian co-worker and best friend R.C., played by Lynn Collins. R.C. introduces her to a similar soul, Peter, played by Michael Shannon, a quiet, modest man who's not dissuaded into hanging out with R.C. and Aggie, even though they're liberally drinking and doing some drugs, which might be par for the course with these two. It's not something out of the ordinary. When R.C. leaves Peter and Agnes alone, it becomes very obvious the two have a void to fill in their lives. Maybe a codependency, maybe just a simple, guttural attraction, maybe just companionship, but whatever it is, Peter stays the night with Agnes. And after their night of closeness and genuine connection, the story takes an unexpected turn. And you know, with the title of this film being Bug and the avenue in which it starts, I could have never predicted where Friedkin and writer Tracy Letts were taking Peter and Agnes' story into this soon-to-be-realized extreme delusion. That's putting it lightly, what follows as a total descent into madness. After the two sleep together, Peter starts itching, and thus starts his debilitating belief that bugs are invading his body and that he and Agnes are surrounded by bugs. It's still curious to me whether Peter's consumptive delusion is triggered by sex, the movie doesn't really answer that, but from here on out, Peter and Agnes fall into a pit of obsession. Referring back to my Kiss the Girls pick of the week in episode 107, I will always watch any Ashley Judd movie. Love her, love her performances. If you haven't seen 2022, She Said, please go out and watch it. But man, in this film, she goes to depths that I've not seen from her. Her character, Agnes, is damaged, receptive to affection from anyone non-aggressive, and Peter captivates her. But by allowing him into her world, no questions asked, she trusts him and begins to accept his delusions. And I give credit to Friedkin and Letts for making me question my sanity throughout the film. Michael Shannon's portrayal of Peter is very convincing. Taking a step away from the film, he's clearly paranoid and struggling with a disorder. But when I'm in it, when I'm watching this movie, I too kind of believe him. Bug plays on the impressionable people who want to trust those that they care for without question, forgetting that even those close to us can also be deceptive, even if they're not malicious. The phenomenon of two people having a delusion together is the strongest theme for me in Bug. Folie ado, as it's commonly referred to, another thing that I learned from the paranoia of X-Files. As Peter's already deep into his own delusions, Agnes's descent is painful to watch because you know there's nothing to be done, especially when she ices out her best friend R.C. from her life. Once a delusion goes from one person to another, the breaking of this is nearly impossible. Along with that theme, Peter obviously has some PTSD from the Gulf War, thus his overwhelming feelings, warranted or not, about government spying, implants, deliberate body infestation of bugs. This is a constant undercurrent throughout the film. And Agnes's fear of abandonment, her inner screaming for a connection to a stable human being, the closest being R.C., who she's discarded from her life. This all brings us to isolation, which is not a great place for two people suffering from a conjoined delusion. I mentioned before that Agnes has been receiving crank phone calls, but I didn't say from who. And honestly, I don't think we ever totally know, but these calls silently sets us up for the paranoia feel that is from minute one when the movie starts. We're led to believe that Agnes is being stalked by her former partner and ex-con named Jerry, played by Harry Connick Jr., And dude, Justin, I don't know if you share this with me or not, but I love seeing Harry Connick Jr. as a bad guy. I know he's easy on the eyes and such a crooner, but I love that he's never shied away from roles that play against who he is. And as Jerry, he plays being an incredibly undesirable and abusive man so believably that he's really terrifying. Jerry's a minor but important character in the overall story. 
Friedkin choosing to take on a gritty, off-the-beaten-path story full of seediness and uncomfortable subject matter makes a lot of sense to me. Not everyone would do a movie like this. It's not an upper, but it's for folks who want to immerse themselves in a foreign world. There's a decent amount of drug use in the film, specifically crystal meth, but oddly, after multiple viewings, the drug usage isn't what sticks out to me. At first it kind of did, but after a couple times it wasn't about that. Does it play an important role in the paranoia bug infestation aspect of the movie? 100%, but I don't think that's the main focus. It's the interplay between two people's descent into madness, their addictive nature towards each other, the PTSD that we can get from war and abusive relationships, and the repercussions of everything involved. The kindness of a stranger should always be taken with a tiny dose of caution. Peter would have been a perfect friend to Agnes, but we never truly know where someone's coming from. Not to play into the overall vibe of the film, but it's hard to leave this one and not think, wow, if Peter didn't have PTSD from the war, could he have helped Agnes find some happiness instead of completely annihilating both their lives? That's a big ask and kind of pointless by the film's climax, but the fact that I leave the film wondering how things could have been different for these two meant that I got sucked into their delusions and felt for them. I guarantee by the time that you get to this film's finale, 20-30 minutes till the end, you won't be able to look away. Bugs one that will stick with me for a really long time. It's funny that you bring up the Harry Connick Jr. thing because uh, last Christmas season, I uh, took Mary to see Harry Connick Jr.'s Christmas show. Well, that was awesome. And it's, you know, all I could think of is his roles in Copycat and, <laughs> and Bug because- I love him in Copycat. His, uh, his show is so like kind of not, you know, it's a little cheesy. I mean, he's doing like sort of like an old school classic Christmas yeah. show. So he's like, hey folks. And, you know, it's just the the personality is like so different than you, what he plays some of these dark characters in movies. Uh, incredible show though. I mean, great singer does me has an awesome band, but um, it's hard to sit there and listen to him sing Christmas songs after uh, watching Bug and Copycat. It's not something that I'm going to be on a mailing list for, but if someone was like, hey, I got this extra ticket to Harry Connick Jr., I'd be like, yes, sign me up. I'm there. He's probably at the top of my list of singers turned actors or that do both because, um, I mean, there's some that don't really pull it off, but he's he always pulls it off. Yeah, just a really a huge career like balancing the two acting Mm -hmm. and being a musician so obviously we love harry connick jr yeah um justin i think it's time to hear about this uh i'm really glad that you're going to be talking about this uh freakin film from 1980 it's kind of funny because i was thinking uh as i was watching cruising as my pick of the week how dark all of our these movies are for (laughs) the christmas seasons like exorcist and then bug and now cruising (laughs) Um, this was the first time watch for me. So I was, uh, had, had only heard about its controversy, you know, and sort of its reputation. And anytime that happens with a movie, I generally try to distance my mind from it the best I can and just like watch a movie with an open mind. So that's how I approached cruising. And this movie is pretty incredible. I mean, it's, I can understand why it was so controversial when it came out. Altogether, it's a really, really well-made like crime thriller, um, sort of a slasher movie as well. Doesn't totally make sense at times. I was left a little confused by the ending and maybe like the last 20 minutes of the movie. But uh, overall, if you've you've only heard about this film's reputation, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. It takes place in late 70s New York. It's about a detective that goes undercover the detective played by al pacino is hired by paul servino from goodfellas and paul servino seems fairly sensitive to the nature of these crimes there's a serial killer that's been targeting and killing gay men mainly in the area of the west village in new york in these like snm leather clubs and so there was a lot of controversy when the movie came out because gay rights advocates felt the movie was stigmatizing Uh, gay men. Uh, Freakin has said time and time again that this was only one aspect of a lifestyle um, where he wanted to focus on do a crime thriller in the backdrop of these S&M and leather bars. And he said a lot of the extras and stuff that were in the bars were actually people that attended these bars. And so I've never been into one of these bars. I can't say how uh, realistic this portrayal is, but I will uh, agree with Freakin. It is an interesting backdrop to have for a crime thriller. 
uh, definitely not one that you've ever seen before. He almost has a killer use like a Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz voice before he kills his victims, uh, which is really strange, uh, but it makes it feel more like a slasher film. What I do appreciate about this movie is that if you have seen a bunch of undercover films, generally there's a lot of tropes in undercover films because the person undercover is usually trying to uh, bring down some sort of crime syndicate. So they have to pair up with the crime syndicate. They they have all this heat on them to not get discovered as a police officer. Um, none of that really exists in this movie because Pacino's character is going undercover as a gay man, but he's not necessarily trying to bring down a ring. He's just trying to go to these clubs, kind of fill people out, question them and try to track down the serial killer. That section of the film is like very fascinating as he immerses himself into this undercover world. Um, where the movie kind of takes like a little bit of a left turn is when Pacino first uh, thinks that he might have the killer. Uh, there's this really bizarre interrogation scene that's a real head scratcher. If you haven't seen the movie, I won't spoil it for you. Uh, but then the movie um, gets a little bit deeper. We start thinking that we know who the serial killer is. The movie's kind of a mystery, and because I feel like this movie's a little underseen, I don't want to spoil a lot, but I did feel like I wasn't quite sure what was going on with the ending. So if anyone has recently seen Cruising or you're about to watch it, you know, let us know your thoughts on it, because it's a little bit open-ended, and I, you know, I, I want to watch it again. I kind of looked up some stuff afterwards on the movie, and there ha there were, like, a lot of criticisms about the ending and the direction of the film. But overall, it's a really good crime thriller, especially if you like Freakin's really gritty urban settings. He just really knows how to capture that really well. He also includes a lot of actors like Joe Spinell and James Remar and Bit Parts, Powers Booth and Bit Parts to give it that extra layer of like those character actors who kind of look the part and seem a little bit scumbaggy. It kind of lends to just the overall feel of the gritty 70s New York movie. But uh, if you want to check out an early, really good performance by Al Pacino, also uh, Karen Allen playing Pacino's girlfriend uh, one year prior to um, doing Indiana Jones is kind of wild. Yeah, I love that she's in this. I mean, she's removed from the main action of the movie, but it. I love that she's in this. And this is loosely based on kind of a true story that happened in the 70s, right? Yeah, it was loosely based on a true story and loosely based on a book that was written by a crime journalist. And Freakin kind of took over. He wrote the script and kind of combined elements and also some people that he knew. Like there were some more killings that were taking place in New York. And once he kind of had the idea of like, oh, I want to do this like backdrop in the leather bars, that was like his reasoning for wanting to do it because when the first when he was first approached with the project he wasn't that interested in it and then I guess you know he started doing his research as freaking does and you know he, he does he does his homework and like really tries to make something believable I didn't re this was a movie I didn't know about when I was younger but it, it was like a modest success at the box office despite all the controversy and critics not liking it and really a interesting part of his career because he sort of in the early 80s was doing that sort of crime city gritty themes you know through the first part of the 80s it was always ironic to me that people were upset because of um, a movie about a killer and involving the gay community that people were saying that this is bad for the gay community but ironically all that it did was um, incite uh, homophobic people to like have an excuse to, I mean, they see cruising and they're like, well, it's, this makes me hate gay people even more. Um, so if anything, it wasn't a negative spin on the gay community. What it did was encourage people's inner homophobia to come out. Isn't it so crazy what can happen from a, a movie that's coming from a true story, you know, that yeah. it can cause this much of an uproar. It's, it's nuts. Thanks for bringing this one up, Justin. Sure. So those are our picks of the week. Freakin's Bug and Cruising. Here's your Murray moment. Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear. And when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're going to come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even chill. Hey, this is so scrumptious. 
Is this hand shot? The flowing robes embrace all striking. That was fun. Aside from The Exorcist being an unsung Christmas film, it also makes me think about the, you know, of course, the balance between good and evil and faith, but also the lengths a mother can go to for her child. And maybe it's just that time of year, but it got me thinking about Lucille Murray, mother to Billy and his eight siblings. Before the Murray's kid's father, Edward, passed away in 1967 when Billy was only 17, the family got by on one income. And as you might imagine, with nine siblings and a shoestring budget, Christmas wasn't the most lucrative holiday filled with a bunch of presents. Although the family was really close, the holiday represented the ingenuity of a penny-pinching Irish Catholic family. I never asked for toys, Bill told the New York Times way back when. Asking for toys was out of the question. It was a low priority. Not that we were denied, we just knew not to make requests. When the Murray kids did get toys for Christmas, Bill said it was guaranteed they were all inherited. They got the basics, the essentials, you know, school clothes. And the siblings buying presents for each other, forget about it. The closest any of us ever came to getting an allowance was finding change in the couch cushions, Bill said. Back then, he'd spend a whole dollar on Christmas presents for the family, which meant everyone was getting something that cost 10 cents. But, you know, keep in mind, 10 cents got you a lot further back then, but ingenuity still mattered. Once Brian, who's five years Billy's senior, had all of these significant-looking presents in crisp boxes under the tree, while all ours resembled badly wrapped body parts. Turns out he'd gotten a bunch of scrap wood from Dad's lumberyard and nailed it into a bunch of big blocks. But Bill got creative, too. The worst year in my case was when I bought two pounds of peanuts from the corner drugstore, wrapped them in tinfoil. It was a terribly lazy move for a ten-year-old to pull, he admits. But to make it worse, Bill confessed that he kept going back each day until Christmas and taking a few nuts from each package. By the time the day rolled around, he said, the matter had just grown disgraceful. Moms never have it easy, whether in the case of Mrs. McNeil and The Exorcist or Mrs. Murray raising nine children. And in 1967, with her kids ranging in age from 4 to 23, Billy at 17, Lucille and the Murrays lost their patriarch, Ed. Heartbroken, grieving, and realizing that someone needed to keep the family afloat, Lucille went back to work, and many of the kids found jobs to support the family. There were a lot of feelings back then. It took a long while for the dinner table to be a nightly laugh riot again. Billy said that he used to reread children's biographies on American heroes like Davy Crockett and Wild Bill Hickok because, quote, they were poor kids when they started out. Billy began to take on summer jobs in order to pay for his tuition at his Catholic high school. Trailing not far behind his older brothers, he made three fifty each time he caddied for a golfer at the fancy nearby Winnetka Indian Hill Golf Club. And after all of these Murray moments, in case it still needs to be said, the stories that the Murray brothers experienced during this time were directly injected into 1980s Caddyshack, thanks to Billy's brother Brian. And it was movies like Caddyshack, Billy's success in SNL, of course, the forthcoming Ghostbusters, he was finally able to repay his mother for all the hard times that befell the family. Lucille had been working in a medical supply company, but was able to put it all behind her once the family entered show business with great success. I feel a little different than the rest of my family, Bill confessed. Having the big success made me feel different. I ended up kind of doing my father's job in some ways. By the late 80s, Lucille Murray was diagnosed with cancer, but she definitely got to reap some benefits from Bill's success. At one point after her diagnosis, Bill said he just gave her a credit card and said, go to town, anything you want. And from the sound of it, Mrs. Murray enjoyed the time that she had left. From a woman who'd originally told Billy or Brian, depending on who you ask, or both, couldn't you just be happy doing community theater? To now she's visiting Hollywood trying to amp up her son's fame. She would call me up and say stuff like, well, people have to come to you now. I mean, we'd taken her out of her dark little world, and now she was some show business authority. I could keep going on about Bill's relationship with his mother, but I think I'll save that for more Murray moments in the future. Suffice it to say, the Murrays struggling over Christmases and being a lower-income family directly influenced all of them. In the absence of their father, Ed, Lucille gave them all the guidance as best she could. All nine of those Murray kids speak so fondly of their mother. How she managed to get the rest of the family raised is amazing, Bill said, and how my father did it on such little money was amazing too. So this Christmas, the time when it's perfectly acceptable to be nostalgic, take a moment to be thankful for those positive influences in your life, those who've guided you into good decisions and supported you, 
even if Mrs. Murray was anti-acting at first for her kids, she eventually came around. And for all the mothers out there who've been up against impossible odds, whether you're trying to save your demon-possessed child in The Exorcist or single-handedly raising your nine children, take a moment to be thankful. So thank you, Mrs. Murray. Without you, this Murray moment wouldn't exist on the podcast and, you know, let alone a worldwide admiration for the kids you raised. I like this little Christmas special Murray moment. <laughs> I tried. I tried to weave some Christmas in there. It is great, too, hearing where Bill Murray came from, this sort of working class yeah. actor and, fam, you know, big family, because you, that's generally you don't hear about uh, actors like that. They usually come from some sort of, you know, wealth or, like, Mm -hmm. they're well off to get into the industry um maybe not so much back in the day but more and more now you, yeah you hear less stories like this yeah definitely well thanks so much for that murray moment of course so this is a pretty big episode so i wanted to keep our final thoughts kind of short but uh we mentioned that there was a reimagining a reboot whatever you want whatever call you want to call it these days <laughs> the legacy sequel yeah uh, i think is what people are calling it of The Exorcist, I did not get to see it in theaters, but you did go see it, and I just was wondering what your thoughts were. It had pretty mixed reviews, but I did hear some people say they really enjoyed it. I was very thankful, actually, that Ellen Burstyn was brought back for it. I was worried at first. I mean, she's really touted as, like, this is Ellen Burstyn's movie. That's not it at all. But how they bring her back in and involve her in the film, I love it. I don't think that it deserved any type of um, like real flack as far as, you know, it wasn't a bad movie. I was entertained. I will say I was not scared at any point, um, but I would say it played more on racial issues than, than anything else, or at least that's what stuck out more to me. And this might be really sacrilegious to say, especially coming from a Ghostbusters fan, but for a reboot reimagining legacy sequel i liked this more than than reitman's ghostbusters that came out jason reitman's ghostbusters you're about to anger some folks on I christmas know. but i will say that the exorcist did something similar that ghostbusters did at the end and i wasn't a fan that they that they went there and i feel like i can't give it away but I feel like everyone's seen Ghostbusters, but the the cheap shot that the new Exorcist does at the end, I'm much more okay with than what happened in the reboot of Ghostbusters. Well, I'm glad you went and saw the movie, and one of us was able to represent. I saw the trailer several times, and it wasn't it didn't get me out to the theaters, but they tried to make um, it different enough, yeah. which I appreciated. Uh, it just wasn't scary to me, but it was it was fine. I'd watch it again. This definitely won't be their first one they're making. Yeah, that's true, huh? Man, there are just some movies that, um, I don't know, are they worth touching? Are they worth keeping on going with? Yeah, especially I, in, in modern movies. I don't know if it translates as well, like I'm worried about, Exorcist movies. I'm worried about this It Follows sequel. Yeah. Just some things like, should you touch it? Just really think about it before yeah. <laughs> before you do this. They'll remake anything. They'll sequelize it's anything. True. It's true. Well, the last thing I want to say is just RIP again to William Freakin. Uh, if you haven't checked out uh, some of his deeper cuts, I highly recommend it. You know, he was more than just the director of The French Connection and The Exorcist. I've really enjoyed going back and watching so many of his films and learning about him as a director. I have a new respect for him, even though he's uh, known to be gruff. And the stories that we've told in this episode were certainly examples of that. But he wasn't a bad guy. Like, to still be on good terms with the actors that maybe he manhandled a little bit. Some people are just a different breed, and that was William Friedkin. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope you have a good holiday season. We are going to be gone for a little while. Um, we're going to take a, a little break and uh, start prepping for 2024, but we won't be back again until the Valentine's Day season, but we will have a special episode for you for our return. Until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reber. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, guys. Thank you.